welcome to a new episode of Pick 6 Movies. What? You don't know what Pick 6 Movies is? Have you not been paying attention for the previous 95 episodes? Eh, it's fine, it's fine. So what we do here is myself, Bo Ransdell, and my oldest and dearest pal, Chad Cooper, we pick six movies based around some crackpot idea of a theme that we come up with. And in this season, it happens to be It's Like Jaws, on account of all these movies being like Jaws. And then we pick six movies based around that theme. You've come upon us at the finale of season 16, It's Like Jaws, and we have a movie that's so much like Jaws, it even has the word Jaws in the name. But it's not really a Jaws movie in the sense that it has no discernible quality or engaging characters or sense of fear or terror. Instead, it's just got a bunch of cheap special effects and Dennis Quaid on cocaine. But I don't want to spoil anything, especially since you're about to get a heap and help of information, courtesy of Chad Cooper. Another thing that we do each and every episode here on this show is whip a little knowledge on you, and that's coming up right now. But I'll be back in just a little bit to join Chad as we cut open this film and see it spill out all over the dock. Thanks for joining us. Enjoy the season finale of season 16 of Pick 6 Movies. It's like Jaws. We get a lot of email and letters here at Pick 6 Movies, and our communications team tries to answer each and every one of them with a computer-generated form letter response. But every now and again, Bo and I dive into the Pick 6 Movies email bag to answer some of the questions that come from you, our listeners. So I thought it'd be fun to dive in, pick a few, and answer them as part of the introduction. Let's see what we have here. Dear Pick 6 Movies, how do you come up with each season's theme? Sincerely, Nicholas. Well, Nicholas, Bo and I walk into the woods and meditate for an hour or two, and then we emerge from our state of contemplation, and we come up with a goofy title, usually with a pun or some terrible wordplay, and then we try to find six movies that all relate to that goofy title. Thanks for writing in. Let's take a look at another, shall we? Dear Bo and Chad, my name is Amy, and I look forward to your podcast every other week. Oh, thanks, Amy. You are both so funny. Are you as insightful and hilarious in person? Thanks, your loyal listener, Amy. Well, the truth is, Amy, we have a team of researchers and writers on staff that all contribute to work to make this show happen. So Bo and I only have to give about 30% of our natural intellect and hilarity to the show. So if you were to ever meet us in real life, we will be measurably more insightful and hilarious than we are on this podcast. Thanks for writing. Let's look at another, shall we? Dear Pick 6 Movies, where are your headquarters located? I looked at your website and didn't see a mailing address. I would like to apply for an internship next semester. Sincerely, Alex, a future hopeful P6M intern. Well, Pick 6 Movies has offices both on the East Coast and now on the West Coast, and we also use production facilities in Chicago, Nashville, and on occasion in Miami to record or do some post-production work. Now, as far as the internships goes, I have no idea how that process works. All I know is that every season a new intern shows up to help us do what we do here, which, by the way, hello to Marcel, the intern who rarely, if ever, talks. Let's move on, shall we? Dear Pick 6 Movies, you two pretend to know a whole lot about a lot of things, and I have some questions for you. How did the 1983 film Jaws 3D ever get made? How does 3D work? And why does the popularity of 3D movies seem to come and go every 10 or 20 years? Sincerely, Sleepless in Secaucus. Whoa, what a stroke of serendipity that I would randomly open this email on this week of all weeks. Sleepless in Secaucus? I'll take your second question first, third question second, and first question last. Let's begin, shall we? How exactly do 3D movies work? Well, 3D movies are an optical illusion where your brain takes two different images and combines them into one image with a sense of depth perception, thus making them look three-dimensional. In the real world, your brain does this naturally. Here's a quick experiment. Look at something sitting nearby. Hold up your phone or look at an empty big gulp cup. Now close one eye. Now open that eye and close the other eye. Now go back to the first eye and then the second eye. 
You see how that object kind of shifts a little bit to the left and the right? Well, this shift in object location is called stereoscopic vision. Your brain takes these two images seen by both of your eyes and it combines them into one image, thus creating a sense of depth perception and you can better judge how far an object is away from you. Did you ever wonder why it was so easy to beat Sammy Davis Jr., Peter Falk, Johnny Depp, or author of The Color Purple, Alice Walker, at a game of darts? Well, it's because each of them are blind in one eye. 3D movies accomplish the same optical illusion by projecting two images simultaneously. One that your left eye can see, and one that your right eye can see, and your brain steps in and does the rest. For your grandparents, 3D movies were projected with a red version and a separate blue version of the film shown at the same time, each with offset images from one another. When you put on the cardboard glasses that were given to you at the movie theater, there was a red and blue filter on each lens, and each of your eyes was capable of just seeing the image filtered through each of these pieces of cheap plastic. When the parts of the movie that were meant to be shown in 3D, they were shot separately through two different lenses, just like the eyes in your head. Using this technology from the mid 20th century, the quality of the film's color was pretty terrible because it was filtered through all this red and blue nonsense. If you've seen a 3D movie in the last 15 years, you may have noticed that the days of the red and blue lenses are long gone and what you now get are gray glasses. This uses the same technique, but it leverages polarized light over colored light. The glasses used today have polarizing lenses that allow each eye to see two separate images through different polarizing filters. The glasses that are handed out at theaters have a different polarizing filter on each eye, which only passes through light that enables the audience member to view each image separately. Your brain takes those two images, combines them into one, and bingo bango, we got ourselves a bona fide 3D movie. Let's move on to question number two. Why does the popularity of 3D movies seem to come and go every 10 or 20 years? That's an easy one, because movie makers need a gimmick to get people into movie theaters. The first commercially released 3D movie was in 1922 and was called The Power of Love. And no, it wasn't a porno. Jeez. This movie never really achieved a wide release, and according to film historians, it's lost to the winds of time. But shortly thereafter, filmmakers created all kinds of new gimmicks to replicate what your eyes and brain do naturally. The Teleview system in 1922 used two film reels to create rapidly alternating images at the same time. Seats in the theater were equipped with small viewers, and they were synchronized to open and close their displays along with the projection of the images on the screen. Look, I, I know what you're thinking. This sounds like a nightmare to maintain, and it was, and that's why it disappeared. After the Great Depression, the use of the red and blue format I was talking about earlier was used under the branding Audioscopics, and it actually won an Academy Award for Best Short Subject Novelty Category. Really, the Academy Awards got rid of that category? I'd love to see that these days. Now, the use of the red and blue filtering of images meant that filmmakers using 3D technology often shot their films in black and white. And audiences at the time wanted color movies. We're not in the Stone Ages here, people. We want some color movies. <laughs> and so it was that Lana Devil was released in full color. It was a full length 3D movie that used the polarized light approach that used the gray tinted glasses over the red and blue approach. Buana Devil used natural vision technology that shot the movie using two separate cameras simultaneously side by side, just like your eyeballs. This also allowed filmmakers to release the movie as a standalone film by just releasing one of the prints made by the cameras. But come on, man, who wants to see that. This is a full length color 3D film and it starred Robert Stack from Unsolved Mysteries fame and it included all kinds of wildlife coming at you as audiences sat riveted in their seats. You know that famous Life magazine where all of the people in the audience are wearing 3D glasses? That was shot during a screening of Buona Devil. Filmmakers, always being keen to rip off what's currently popular, were also freaked out during the 1950s because people started watching more television and and not going to the movies. And filmmakers needed something to get people to drag their lazy asses out of their homes to go experience something they couldn't see on TV. And so 
so it was in the 1950s, the golden age of 3D filmmaking began. In 1953, The House of Wax was released, starring Vincent Price, who would go on to be closely associated with 3D horror movies. Disney Studios got in on the 3D action with some short films. Alfred Hitchcock fooled around with 3D in Dial in for Murder, which helped to make 3D seem like a legitimate way to make a movie. But ultimately, 3D failed because of technological issues involving the need for two projectors running at once, if the movie was out of sync, audience members got headaches watching these films, and ultimately 3D movies said farewell with the sequel to The Creature from the Black Lagoon, a movie titled Revenge of the Creature. 3D cinema was revived a bit when Arch Gobbler found a technological workaround of showing two prints at the same time with an innovative approach where two stereoscopic images were layered onto a single reel. The trade-off here was that the movies had less clarity and almost no color saturation. But who cares about clarity and colors when it comes to a visual medium like motion pictures? In the 1970s, a company called StereoVision developed another 3D technology where two images were combined through a polar filter to create a single 3D image. The first movie to use this technology was a porno. Not really, but it kind of was a porno. The movie was called The Stewardesses. This film followed the events of a single night of a bunch of Los Angeles-based trans-Pacific stewardesses partying and doing drugs and having sex. And one of them befriends and has sex with a Vietnam combat soldier just back from the war. The main character commits suicide by jumping off of a 30-story tall building. Did I mention this was a comedy? Seeing topless stewardesses in 3D showed filmmakers that there was more of an adult audience when it came to 3D films. And in the 1980s, there was a boom in the at-home video market through Laserdiscs and Betamax and VHS tapes, and the movie industry freaked out and said, hey, we need a gimmick to get people back in theaters. Enter 3D movies. Around this time, there was a film released in 1981 called Coming At Ya, and no, it wasn't a porno. It was a Western, and it was kind of successful in its limited release. And this movie sparked the second wave of 3D filmmaking in the early 1980s. Similar to the first wave of 3D cinema, it was horror movies that were tapped to bring the most horrifying 3D films to hit the screen. Certain film franchises were growing up in the 1980s, and 3D seemed to be a good fit to inject some oomph into these fledgling horror movie series. In 1982 and 1983, movies like Parasite in 3D and Amityville 3D and Friday the 13th Part 3 in 3D and Jaws 3D all embraced the gimmicky technology in an effort to lure movie-going audiences out of their houses and into theaters. In addition to these forgettable movies, the early 80s produced another feature film called Space Hunter Adventures in the Forbidden Zone. Starring, among others, an actress who is always pretty in pink, 16 Candles' own Molly Ringwald. This movie was billed as an epic space western and had a great big budget, and it tanked at the box office. Heck, I saw it in theaters when I was a kid, and even with the low threshold of what passes for a quality movie held by most preteens, at that time I knew this movie was a turd. So as quickly as the use of 3D was reintroduced, it was pronounced dead again for movie-going audiences. 3D films then slunked their way over to IMAX theaters, in museums, and theme parks, most notably in the Michael Jackson spectacular Captain EO, which premiered in 1986 at the Epcot theme park in Orlando, Florida, and then a few years later over at the nearby Disney's MGM Studios theme park, Jim Henson's Muppet Vision 3D showed up in 1991. Now down the road from those theme parks, Universal Studios Florida introduced T2 3D Battle Across Time which featured Arnold Schwarzenegger as the Terminator, and this movie was directed by James Cameron. Can you guess where all this is going? A few years later, James Cameron made a little movie called Titanic. Maybe you heard of it? This epic spectacular and Cameron's work on The Abyss introduced James Cameron to the world below the waves, and Cameron subsequently made a documentary film called Ghost of the Abyss, which explored the underwater wreckage of the RMS Titanic in 3D. And the success of this documentary led Robert Rodriguez to think, hey, I got a third Spy Kids movie coming out. What if I made that in 3D? Sure enough, that's what he did. Spy Kids 3D Game Over came out in theaters and it did all right at the box office, 
but it was the 3D IMAX version of the holiday classic, The Polar Express, released in 2004, that really set the third revival of 3D movies in motion. The Polar Express wasn't originally made to be a 3D movie, but advancements in digital technology allowed the movie to be given a 3D treatment specifically for the IMAX screen. This version of the movie made 14 times as much in theaters showing the film in 3D than it did when compared to the film being shown in 2D. Now why was that? Well, more people went to see the 3D version, which was released every year in IMAX until 2012. And all of those tickets to go see this 3D version of the Polar Express, well, they cost more than the regular old 2D version. Movie studio head said, Say, what if we were to use digital technology to take our 2D movies and convert them into 3D? We could charge more money for the tickets, and then we would make more money. <laughs> Brilliant idea. Jeeves, set fire to this $100 bill. I need to light another cigar. The first film to successfully undergo this digital process of 3 d was 2006 Superman Returns. <laughs> but it wasn't going to be the last. Harry Potter movies started showing up in 3D. Heck, every children's animated film from Bolt to Up to Coraline all got the early 2000s three-dimensional cinematic treatment. And then, in 2009, James Cameron's Avatar happened. There we go. Avatar was a sci-fi epic that took everything James Cameron learned about 3D movie making while working on Ghost of the Abyss, and he funneled it into a mostly unoriginal script that broke box office records left and right, landing it as the top grossing movie of all time, raking in like two bajillion dollars. 3D had finally arrived. It was no longer a gimmicky way to trick people into going to the movies. It was going to revolutionize how movie making was made forever, said people who were wrong about the future. Audiences let movie makers know that they really didn't give a shit about seeing a movie in 3D as much as they enjoyed paying a lower price to see that same movie in 2D. Slowly, the glut of 3D movies appearing in theaters began to drift away. And over a decade later, diehard Avatar fanboys are still awaiting the promised sequels, so we'll see if 3D once again returns to theaters at the critical moment where streaming services are taking over and keeping people at home on their couches at a time when movie theaters and film distributors need audiences the most. So without any delay, ladies and gentlemen, threes and Ds, Pick 6 Movies proudly presents to you 1983's Jaws 3D. What, what? I didn't talk about how Jaws 3D was made, did I? Ah, shit. All right, change out the music bed. I'm heading back into the water. Back in 1975, a wide-eyed young film director was tapped by Universal Studios to bring a novel about a shark terrorizing a seaside summer resort town to the big screen based on a novel by Peter Benchley. Steven Spielberg was his name, and the movie was a huge hit, and it created what is known today to be the summer blockbuster or tentpole movie. High concept, lot of stars, action, adventure, big box office revenue. Jaws was so successful, it demanded a sequel. Mr. Spielberg was unavailable because he was off making close encounters of the third kind. So the studio brought in John Hancock to direct, but he quit over disagreements with producers. So to take over the director's chair, filmmakers tapped Jeno Swark, who brought the film Somewhere in Time to the Silver Screen. That's a movie about time travel through hypnosis. I recommend you stick with DeLoreans as your means of time travel, and you'll be all the better for it. Trust me on this one. Guy looks at a penny and everything just falls apart. Stupid. Back to Jaws 2. So the movie comes out, and it's successful enough that Universal Studios wants a third installment of the Jaws franchise. At the time, you know what movie was really successful? The Zucker Abrams Zucker disaster movie spoofing and genre creating film, Airplane. So the movie executive said, Say, what if we made a new Jaws movie, but we made it a comedy with topless broads and hilarious gay guys and that mom from Leave it to Beaver talking jive to black guys on an airplane plane, but with a shark. Saturday Night Live was already making fun of Jaws with the land shark bit at the time, unbeknownst to filmmakers, or maybe it was beknownst. The third Superman sequel was taking a similar approach by injecting unwanted comedy into its third installment with Richard Pryor as an addition to that film's franchise legacy. 
Some studio head said, You know who makes funny movies? Those people over at the National Lampoon. Let's get them to make a Jaws movie for us. And so it was that the third installment of the Jaws franchise was to be called, Jesus Christ, Jaws 3, People Zero. Ugh. John Hughes, who was behind National Lampoon's Vacation and would go on to pen The Breakfast Club and Ferris Bueller and Curly Sue. Yeah, you forgot he made Curly Sue, didn't you? Well, John Hughes was brought in to write the screenplay and to direct the movie would be Joe Dante, the guy who directed the Jaws ripoff, Piranha. Stick with me here, people. This movie was going to be about a film crew trying to make a sequel to Jaws 2. And the shark was going to be an alien. And it would open with Peter Benchley, the author of the original novel, being eaten by a shark in his swimming pool. The whole thing felt like one of those scary movie train wrecks where they just take legitimate scenes from a movie you know and then you make them kind of stupid. For example, the scene where they gut the shark, it was proposed that they would pull out all kinds of increased absurd items like a violin or a giant coat and a bag of weed. See, you thought coming into this episode, man, Jaws 3D is terrible, but believe me, Jaws 3D could have been so very, very much worse. Now, luckily, this didn't happen, and studio executives wised up and decided to make a more serious Jaws sequel. Alan Landsberg, who was a producer on the TV shows That's Incredible and In Search Of, he got wind that a Jaws sequel was ripe for the producing. So Landsberg got the rights to the Jaws sequel, and he went looking for a new take on a movie that had already been made twice. Screenwriter Gerdon Trueblood came up with the idea of setting the movie in a semi-underwater amusement park where the guests and employees would come face to face with the great white shark. Sure, why not? To direct the movie, Jaws veteran Joe Alves was brought in. He worked as a production designer on the original Jaws as well as Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So maybe some of that that Steven Spielberg magic rubbed off on him, right? This was to be the seventh film that Alves was supposed to direct. All the other six fell through. Uh-oh. Carl Gottlieb, who worked on the screenplay for both the original Jaws and its sequel, Jaws 2, he was brought in to provide guidance on how to make a killer shark movie. As the script came together, filmmakers felt that the movie was mostly a retread of the first two films. And during a visit to Marineland in Florida, producer Landsberg and director Alves saw an underwater 3D movie and two light bulbs went off over their heads. What if we make this movie in 3D? It'll be a game changer. They went to the Universal Studio executives and they loved it so much, they pretended it wasn't their idea in the first place. At the time, there were a few options on how you can make a 3D movie. You could use color glasses or polarized glasses. There were decisions that had to be made around, do you shoot it with one camera? Do you shoot it with two cameras at the same time? Alves, the film's director, he felt that 3D was a tool and he took a practical approach to using the means of filmmaking as a form of artistic expression. At the time, Alves Alves said, I don't want Jaws 3D to be thought of as just another uh, 3D flick. I think it can hold up as a flat film since it was around that concept for a long time before we went 3D. And I can see why he said that. At the time, 3D movies were filled with stupid gimmicks and there was no way that Alva's vision of a Jaws sequel would stoop to such pedestrian visual nonsense. Except that that's completely what they ended up doing in the movie. The film's crew limited the amount of underwater photography needed to make the movie. They'd learned some lessons from those first two Jaws films. To accomplish this, filmmakers decided to film Jaws 3D at SeaWorld in Orlando, Florida. The theme park is nowhere near the ocean, so that made no sense regarding the narrative of the film. But it was open and easy to shoot a movie in, and the theme park was all too happy to get free press from the partnership with the filmmakers. Take that, Disney World! Although SeaWorld Orlando is 70 miles from any ocean, filmmakers did shoot some scenes with skiers out on the ocean, and they came up with a nonsense plot device about an underwater tunnel that led out to the ocean as a way of explaining how the shark got into this aquatic theme park in the first place. More on that later. To film the shark, special effects teams used five different scale sharks. There was a one-to-one -one scale shark for close-ups, and all all different size smaller sharks for more distant shots. The production 
construction crew built a circular tank at SeaWorld for up close shots with round portholes through which underwater action could be filmed from outside. This tank had walls 26 feet tall and entire sets could be lowered into the water for filming. Pretty clever. Now the narrative of Jaws 3D was tied to the first two movies and it featured the grown up sons of Chief Brody. Dennis Quaid played the older brother, Mike Brody. Quaid later admitted in interviews that he was out of his mind on cocaine during pretty much the entire filming of this movie. That's fun. Younger brother Sean Brody was played by John Putch, who at the time appeared on the TV sitcom One Day at a Time. Academy Award winning actor Louis Gossett Jr. plays theme park owner John Hammond. <laughs> I mean Calvin Bouchard. Catherine Morgan, who is fresh off co-starring with Tom Selleck in the film High Road to China, plays a marine scientist. Leah Thompson made her big screen debut in this film before appearing in Tom Cruise's film All the Right Moves, and she was in Red Dawn. And then she hit it big as Lorraine McFly in the original Back to the Future. Star of TV's Manimal, Simon McCorkendale shows up, and there's a bunch of other actors and actresses that we'll get into here in a minute when Bo arrives when we start teasing this apart one scene at a time. Film production got underway, and like every other Jaws movie, there were production issues. This time it wasn't the shark that wouldn't work. All the trouble revolved around 3D technology. The filmmakers decided to use the AeroVision 3D system to make their movie, but it wasn't ready for delivery at the time of production start. So the filmmakers called up StereoVision to see if they had a 3D lens that they could use to make their movie. Yes, StereoVision had something they could use. So the filmmakers shot with StereoVision for one week, but then the AeroVision rig showed up in week two. So everybody had to be retrained on how to use the new technology. And nobody on the crew had any experience working with 3D technology. Cameraman Jim Conter, he worked on Jaws as a camera operator, and he later went on to serve as the director of photography on the film Cruising. Whoa, that's a movie I'd like to see in 3D. Conter and his crew helped to find problems in composition of shots and set design, and eventually things really got rolling. For all the movie's use of special effects, including early use of green screen technology, production of the movie leaned heavily on practical effects, including explosions and the smashing of buildings. Jaws 3D wrapped up production ahead of schedule and under budget. The movie was also shot in such a way that it could easily be shown in the 2D format if needed for future television rebroadcasts. Producer Alan Landsberg knew the movie was going to be a success, stating, In every theater, we've been running the trailer for two months. When the words in 3D come on the screen, there's an invariable cheer from the audience. It seems we're right. This is a great idea. Jaws 3D will excite the imagination. So, Jaws 3D hits theaters, and it pulls in $13.4 million on its first weekend, which was the second highest grossing opening weekend of the year 1983. Number one, Return of the Jedi. Now, Superman 3's opening weekend was just $100,000 less than that of Jaws 3D's total take. Maybe they should have made Superman 3 and 3D 2. Although Jaws 3D had a huge opening weekend, that meant that people saw the movie and realized it was terrible, and they told other people that. And almost a third of the movie's total box office haul was from that first weekend. The movie was heavily panned by critics. Everybody's lovable, huggable, favorite film critic Roger Ebert said of the film, Jaws 3D is total shit. Don't go see it unless you're a fucking idiot. I'm paraphrasing a bit here, of course. But he did think that the movie was terrible. Over on Rotten Tomatoes, it's currently got a 12% freshness rating. And yes, we know that the Jaws film series has a fourth installment, Jaws the Revenge, which has a zero freshness rating over on Rotten Tomatoes. But look, people, we can't have two movies in the same season that feature Michael Caine. Sleepless in Secaucus, I hope this introduction answered all of your questions. Thank you for emailing us at picksixmovies at gmail.com. You know what? Enough of this auditory epistolary. Let's get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to wrap up this season's theme, It's Like Jaws, with a spectacular finale that's so big and so bold that two dimensions of normal cinema cannot contain it. Ladies and gentlemen, threes and Ds, I proudly present to you 1983's Jaws 3D. It's like Jaws, 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 but in 3D! Trumpet guy, trumpet guy, trumpet, trumpet guy, trumpet guy, trumpet guy, do your thing! And whoa!
welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I'm Chad Cooper, and I am joined with my multi-talented, multi-faceted, multi-dimensional co-host, Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing this evening for the season finale of season 16's theme, It's Like Jaws? I'm telling you, season finale time is always a big deal around here. In case you skipped the brilliant introduction that I did, this is our season finale, and we are featuring Jaws 3 in 3D. It's not Jaws 3D. That never happened to the best of my knowledge. Bo, do you like 3D movies? I do, actually. I do not. <laughs> I get headaches watching 3D movies, and I have only seen five 3D movies in my entire life. Don't worry, I'm going to tell you about all of them. Oh, please. <laughs> uh, I think it's the difference between those who have done hallucinogens and those who have not. Bo, the first 3D movie I ever saw in my life was Jaws 3D. And I got dropped off at the Martin Four movie theater in our hometown when I was a kid. And I got paired up with this other kid who was the nephew of this old spinster friend of my family. And this kid wanted to go see Jaws 3D. And I did not because I thought if I went to see this movie in the theater... I might die. I'll tell you, let me match your th Jaws 3D story because I did not see Jaws 3D, but I was literally getting ready to go see this movie with my cousin, Johnny Mike. Uh-huh. And right before we left to go to the theater, apparently Johnny Mike's aunt on like his mother's side who was not directly related to me in any way that i could do on paper did she go see it and die she didn't see it but she fucking died all right and <laughs> that ruined the movie for me so i never got to go see jaws 3d which in retrospect I owe that woman a great deal of thanks. <laughs> when I went to see this movie, it was opening weekend. And the line stretched from the movie theater through the entire parking lot all the way down to the white trash video game arcade known as Funland in our hometown where every video game cabinet came with four to six caramel and black cigarette burns on the console to give it that mwah, authentic look of thugs were here what are you not gonna smoke and play miss pac-man are you crazy <laughs> Every town in America had a fun land or a fun land equivalent. It was accompanied by a hastily constructed nine hole mini golf course and two batting cages that were never both operating at the same time. I think fun land only had an eight hole golf course, if memory serves. <laughs> Just do number eight twice and bring me the ball. Turn the six upside down when you go back through. <laughs> I think our fun land on Friday and Saturday nights only allowed people 18 and up to enter this fine establishment because of the flagrant display of low life goals. Low lifery, I think it is how that's called by the hoi polloi. Sucking all chili dogs outside the taste of free. Yeah, it, like it's a John Mellencamp song <laughs> if there were more methamphetamines and fingering yeah this was where people went and sold shit weed and teenage girls made terrible choices in who they should let impregnate them and guys would show up on ninja motorcycles with their custom pool cues to show off their color of money impressions it's in the way that you move it so i mentioned i saw jaws 3d i also saw space hunter 3d which i may have seen in the theater with you maybe but i would also wager i've never seen that movie it, it's one or the other we saw it together i've never seen it <laughs> years later i accidentally saw monster house in 3d but i didn't know i was seeing it in 3d until i paid for my ticket and then they handed me the glasses and i went in the theater and that was entertaining enough and then i saw avatar and then Bo, i saw the greatest movie ever made in 3d jackass 3d yeah <laughs> i i mean I took the day off of work and went to a 2 p.m. afternoon matinee with my wife while our son was in daycare for an extra hour so we could see Jackass 3D. And it was fantastic. That is a movie that got 3D right. I really like this image I have of you like, suck it, Mr. Hodgson. I'm taking off early today. I got some Jackass to watch. There was a dildo bazooka in it. I mean, hard to argue. See naked penises that almost fall right in your lap. <laughs> See those rubber dildos coming right at you. No, you'll <laughs> never see hideous effects like these again. 
Till we bring you Jackass 3D Part 2. Well played, sir. <laughs> See what I did there? I turned the tables on Mr. Weird Al Yankovic, where I took one of his original songs, Nature Trail to Hell, and I applied my own hilarious alternative lyrics. It's good that somebody's finally taken that guy down a peg. <laughs> My dad had a porno magazine that had a 3D layout in it that came with glasses. And the guy in the layout was like this John Holmes character, some guy with this frighteningly enormous penis. And when you put the glasses on, the penis just came off the page. Not literally, but you get the idea. <laughs> because it was so well written. <laughs> really just came to life. It's just this giant horse cock of a guy. I was like, well, I didn't know 3D work. Whoa! It was like reading Pat Conroy. <laughs> just <laughs> leapt off the page. So vivid was it. Are there any 3D movies that you wish you had seen in the theater but did not? Or if they were going to be reissued in 3D on the big screen that you would want to go and experience them in the third dimension? Yeah, probably. I don't know that I saw Final Destination 5 in the theater. I didn't know it's a thing, but okay. But it was in 3D uh, in the, the last wave of 3D movies. And that was a movie that got 3D right. I, I probably would have enjoyed seeing that with a crowd. You know, for nostalgia's sake, I'd love to see the original House of Wax in 3D in a theater with a crowd of people. Uh, that'd be a good time. I think Life of Pi was one of those movies that really embraced 3D as an artistic contribution to the storytelling. I think Friday the 13th Part 3 in 3D would be fun. I gotta stop you on the Friday the 13th Part 3 chad that movie should be destroyed for no other reason than the uh, character by the name of shelly in that film i love shelly that is one of the most irritating characters in <laughs> film history i hate that character so so much <laughs> He's so desperate. It's awful. And, and people will tell you, Chad, hey, Shelly is the guy what gave Jason Voorhees the hockey mask. And they're right. And I would say that is too high a price to pay <laughs> for the iconic hockey mask. You know, another movie that I would go see just out of curiosity that was made in 3D, Robert Zemeckis made a movie called The Walk, which was a remake of the documentary about Philippe Petit's 1974 high wire walk between the Twin Towers. That's a really good documentary. And I think that Zemeckis does a good job playing with new forms of technology and filmmaking. And to see that film in 3D the way that he was having a good time with it, I think would be interesting. I have a now non-functional, sadly, 3D television. I was one of those suckers. I did have a 3D television and I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was the active glasses that were battery powered and whatnot. Okay. That was a lot of fun. Like I have a lot of those Marvel movies in 3D as a result result of that did you ever watch porno in 3d um no i didn't know that like that sounds like a yes <laughs> did i ever yes did i do it on the regular no it's, it's a bridge too far i don't need that in my life can i have my dad call you please i would love to see what zirkle's up to these days yeah he's dead so not much let's talk about jaws 3d our movie starts off with a hacky gag of 3d when the universal globe logo and the words universal and mca company come onto the screen in 3d fashion 3d is coming at you from the get-go it's a nice tone setter to let you as a modern viewer know this movie is going to look like utter garbage from jump because even the logo looks kind of shitty yes this is immediately followed with some john williams knockoff jaws music and we're underwater as the opening credits are all shown in this right red font that is elongated to really accentuate the 3d technology that we're showing off as the camera pans around we see a few extras from finding nemo flittering this way and that and then we hear a crunch and the screen fills with a red cloudy liquid and the disembodied head of some wall-eyed fish comes floating out slowly to amaze you in 3d as its mouth slowly opens and closes and opens and closes Bo, it goes on for so long chad it's <laughs> stunning they definitely definitely give you the look uh in this movie of like hey 3d right everybody <laughs> this fish head and it is terrible and and, the, and like you said this john williams or juan williams music that's playing 
<laughs> it's such a subpar riff. Like everything about this feels like a Jaws movie uh-huh. down to the camera moving through the coral and all that. Right. It's not, but it feels like one of those Italian knockoffs. Yes. Where it was made for about 200 grand off the coast of the Mediterranean and the only <laughs> American actor is Richard Jekyll. That kind of movie. When the title comes up, it says Jaws 3, but the three is in Roman numerals, which is strange because that's not what I saw on the poster when I walked in to see it in the Martin Ford Theater. That's the point I would have walked out. This is bullshit. Hey, like on the poster. Also, one thing that was left out of the introduction was the inclusion of Richard Matheson as the writer of this thing, or co-writer. And Richard Matheson, if you don't know, he's the guy who wrote the book I Am Legend that a bunch of movies were based on, wrote a lot of classic Twilight Zone, did Legend of Hell House. I mean, just this brilliant genre writer that's worked for decades and made some of the best books and screenplays uh, around in that genre. I found out that he said that there were so many ghost writers brought in on this movie as you might imagine Uh that his original premise the reason he got credit for this was that his script was about a shark that swam upstream into a lake and got trapped there and so there's a lake with a jaws in it and the reason he got credit was like well in this one there's a pipe from the ocean into sea world so that's kind of a lake. I left it out of the intro because he owes me a thousand dollars. Oh, how come? You don't want to know. Mm, now I definitely <laughs> want to know. I'll tell you later. So following all of our opening credits where we see names of people in the movie in 3D in this blood red font that just goes on and on. We cut to a group of about 12 skiers made up of men and women and they're behind a boat being pulled out in the ocean and the women start climbing up on the men's shoulders to build a pyramid, which I don't understand how this happens exactly where everyone's on water skis and then one by one they kick off their skis and climb up on the shoulders of other people. This seems to be a very expensive exercise in stupidity, leaving these skis in the water. I think it's a very particular kind of person that sees human pyramids on water skis Uh and thinks, how did they do that? Are you talking about me? Well, I suppose I am. To me, it felt like if you watched a marching band do all of their little shapes, and then at the end of it, they set their instruments on fire. In fairness, I think, Chad, that the ladies are basically riding piggyback on the guy ski and they're not just kicking them off and leaving them in their wake yeah oh is that how that happens i don't i don't think they're going through water skis like toothpicks here huh I should pay attention more often. Or less. I I think you could go either way with it. During all of this opening ski kicking nonsense that we're talking about, the credits continue to obscure this pyramid building. And one credit that really stuck out to me was a phrase that said, suggested by the novel Jaws. When based on a true story is even that is too much of a reach. What does that mean? Somewhat loosely inferred by the novel (laughs) Jaws by Peter Benchley? (laughs) Implied? Yeah. By the novel Jaws. Plot adjacent to the novel Jaws. <laughs> Somewhat reminiscent of the novel Jaws. It's really clutching at anything to try to pretend that this is an actual movie. <laughs> Where it's like, yeah, yeah, it's kind of like it was based on, I mean, it's not based on the book, but if you read that book and then we're like, hey, I'm going to go to SeaWorld. Hey, I wonder what would happen if that shark went to SeaWorld. That's, <laughs> you know, that counts. Jaws-ish by Peter Benchley. Yeah, Jaws-esque. <laughs> Sousant of Jaws. Uh, it's just got a whiff, just a, 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 a real foamy head of Jaws. <laughs> And we get our first look at Leah Thompson. This is her first movie. Uh Uh-huh. And Leah Thompson's one of the skiers. As they're doing their pyramid thing, we get our first look at a fin in the distance, Chad. Credit where credit's due. We are four minutes, 12 seconds into this movie. We've seen a fish eaten, and we saw its floating head in bloody cloud water. We have a skiing pyramid of teenagers, and we see a shark on the prowl. Pretty good pacing, Jaws 3D. For about the first seven minutes, and then... And it really falls off a cliff for the next 60. They got the first four questions out of 100 right. And then after that, it was C, 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 C. Yeah, it started off with, oh, he's a straight A student. And 10 minutes into the 
test. It's, oh, we might have to give him another test. A more special test. We cut over the shore where there's some bodybuilder named Shelby Overman. Who is this sun-kissed, bronzed, ripped man full of muscles? He shaves smooth from the neck down. He's got a glorious mustache that looks like he belongs on the set of a porno shoot. Maybe that 3D porno you were talking about, Bo. Or maybe the guy in my dad's stroke book collection. He's a real Adonis, uh, this guy. <laughs> and and Leah Thompson gets wind of him and immediately just destroys all this pyramid stuff. She does a one muscle. She's like, hey, show your muscles like this. Then down goes the pyramid. So she's responsible for their practice ending horribly and everybody having to stay late. We get the legs kicking underwater, which is signature of any Jaws movie. It's kind of that aquatic dinner bell. Yeah, but don't worry, listeners. Nothing's going to happen for a long time, so don't even worry about it. And while the the skiers are in the water, like kicking their legs and you know attracting jaws, like really ringing the dinner bell for the shark, <laughs> the boat driver even is like, "Oh my god, I flooded the darn engine!" Again, the shark is like sneaking up on them, just tiptoeing up. The camera gets real close to these kicking legs, and then the boat fires up, and they go skiing off. And it's a real like, "Woo!" There was almost something that happened in this movie. But when they ski off, Bo, all of the men are on their skis, and the women are holding their backs piggyback style yeah it amazed the hell out of me i think that's how they start i think that's why you're not losing all those skis i gotta watch this again never i yeah you really don't let's head over to sea world yeah where the stepford sea world training has taken place yeah i wish more of the movie had been this and this character in particular of the woman who's in charge of the sea world training of like here's how you greet all the guests and she's really given all these young women a hard time about like listen the sea world uniform form has been carefully <laughs> measured those shorts don't need to be any shorter whores and they're like oh my god she's <laughs> she's telling them they gotta have their hair this way and no dirty fingernails and she says if you show any cheek you're gonna be back shoveling fries yeah because she's talking about their ass cheeks and again i want way more of this out of the movie where i want to see the power struggles like does she eventually learn from this group of plucky young women to loosen up and have a good time but they also learn that a little structure isn't necessarily a bad thing dude let's write a rosencrantz and gildenstern of jaws 3d jaws 40 (laughs) by Bo and Chad. Look at the success of 3D and (laughs) multiply that by one. So all these girls giggle and none of this matters at all. The camera pans over to some skinny comb over stiff and he's holding an intimate press conference showing the lay of the land where this new attraction, Undersea Kingdom, is going to debut at SeaWorld. It costs $34 million, which in modern day bucks, it's about $100 million, which I have no idea if that's a lot of money or not. I mean, it's more than I got, but I don't know if building something like this is that's a big I don't think $100 million gets them there, but it's also why this thing falls apart immediately it's upon pretty shoddy yeah so if you've never seen this movie which is pretty much everybody here's the lay of the land for this undersea kingdom there is a circular hub and there are four arms that stick out of it so that people can go underwater and look at stuff that's sunk it sounds fantastically boring if you ask me well it's got an undersea haunted house which we get a glimpse of for a second i guess it's got the neptune room which is the restaurant and bar and then there's the observation stuff and it's fine i mean maybe this is just what 100 million gets you right there's a (laughs) sunken spanish galleon that they've built there to draw the eye i suppose it's 40 feet underwater that doesn't seem like that big of a deal well of course not because again if this thing goes belly up which it's gonna for 100 million (laughs) dollars that you've got to be able to get to the surface quick you don't want anybody swimming up after this thing buckles under the (laughs) pressures of 40 feet of water that they could swim to the surface you know we cut over to lewis gossett jr who has some binoculars and he's peeping on some people turns out he's peeping on the water skiers making the pyramid from earlier but still kind of a pervert move oh oh yeah look at him it's just like john larroquette in that movie stripes (laughs) oh boy i want to see them girls on the skis the movie cuts back to the ocean and we see the dorsal fin appear again and this is jaws 3d and 
the shark's like, hey, everybody, it's me, Jaws 3D, the star of the movie. I'm like the original Jaws, but in 3D and more unwatchable. It, it is unwatchable. The gate that they're trying to close uh-huh. gets stuck because Jaws 3D is trying to get in there. Keep it open. I need to get through here. A broken gate is a shark's best friend. <laughs> Brutus the Barber Beefcake here is <laughs> trying to close this gate, and he's like, I guess it's stuck. And finally, Jaws 3D slips through, like, kathunk. What stupid son of a bitch closed this gate while I was trying to get into the lagoon to eat those people? Yeah, cry. And immediately they turn on this Shelby guy and they're like, hey, didn't you say you fixed this? And he's like, I did. I did fix this, but I don't know. Maybe it hit a Jaws 3D or something. And they're like, you're dumbass. No, it didn't. <laughs> And so they're like, well, somebody better call Mike Brody. You know, the teenager from the last movie. Who? Just call Mike Brody. Brady? Brody. Who? Idiot. Just give me the phone. <laughs> the one guy in this movie named Mike. Call him. And so we cut away from that to Louis Gossett Jr., uh, who's still ogling these skiers. Yep. And breaks away to go address the crowd that's gathered to hear all about this Undersea Kingdom stuff. It's a bunch of people from the press, it seems like. Somebody's got a camera, but it's never really clear. There's a lot of this movie that's just a real shrug. I think you just described the entire production of this film. Someone's got a camera, it's never real clear, and there's a whole bunch of shrugging. I mean, we could wrap it up right here, Chad. That's been season 16. <laughs> pick six movies no but lewis gossett jr kind of strolls into this crowd and takes over he does he holds court you see them girls on skis oh he i love them so much mr phillips fitzroy's gonna be here a little bit later today he gonna stir some shit up philly fitzroy's philly fitz the one and only he gonna be here <laughs> who wants free drinks at the bar all huh? right who wants to get drunk they free follow me you bunch of news hound buzzards <laughs> i know you boys want a day drink come on now so all these reporters who are just a bunch of notoriously alcoholic day drinkers. They all gleefully follow along, happy in the knowledge that they're soon going to be drunk and having sex with a stranger. Probably somebody else in the press corps. We cut back over to the underwater gate that got smashed when Jaws 3D ran into it. And a bunch of divers, they're there and Michael Brody shows up and they have to give him the bad news that the gate got busted. Mike Brody, of course, is Dennis Quaid in this movie. <laughs> yes. And is just a jerk from jump he's like hey uh what happened here uh i'm just i thought you fixed this it's bu- wait it's busted it's busted who, who broke this who's gonna fix it is anybody here thirsty i'm thirsty who wants something to drink i'm gonna go get something to drink who wants some coke who wants a coke a coke a coke coca-cola i'm thirsty Are you thirsty you know what? i'm gonna get on this jet ski i'll be back later with some coke for all of us but mostly me bye the real standout of this scene to me is the fact they're like, hey, all right, well, if we fix this gate, that's going to take some overtime. And he's like, no, 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 no. There's no overtime. No, no, overtime. no, no. no. None. None. Uh, None. You already uh, worked plenty of overtime. Uh, you got all the overtime you need. <laughs> Everybody got some overtime. Uh, anyway, jet ski. <laughs> see you guys later. <laughs> and the j- jet ski, by the way, the segue of the sea in this movie, uh-huh. where it's just step on, <laughs> go to the next scene. I really like it. When it cuts to the other side of the lagoon where Dennis quaid arrives on this jet ski he hops off onto the dock and he just tosses the jet ski in the water it's like a kid tossing his bike on the front lawn Eh, somebody else will take care of that shit hey guess what kathy i'm home i I came over on the jet ski (laughs) where'd i leave it who knows who's asking it's so weird that you would ask me about that right now quaid hops onto the dock he's like my heart is racing does anybody else have a joint or a high life to help me calm my nerves no you know what i'm gonna go ask my girlfriend you know she's a doctor and she's an ocean doctor and she she can't write prescriptions for people but she can get her hands on dolphin tranquilizers boy they pack a punch hey where's my girlfriend i'm gonna go find her now did i mention that she's a doctor see you later bye his girlfriend kathy is her name in this movie Uh uh-huh she is a biologist and one presumes sort of a head trainer or something here she's a bikini supermodel astrophysicist yes (laughs) and she is hanging out with cindy and sandy the dolphins Uh uh-huh and gives them a little fat shaming here where she's like oh boy they're really getting tubby how about you take them out to the lagoon they don't want to go get these fat bastards in there i don't care what they say they need to take some laps but why do women do this? Why are they constantly judging each other's physical appearance? Why can't women support one another and quit being so judgmental, even if those other women are dolphins? It's a real bummer to see them really go after 
after each other like this. But in fairness, as we will discover soon in the movie, these dolphins are kind of jerks. And also, Kathy is played by Bess Armstrong, who is one of those actresses that looks like a whole bunch of other people. Because when I watched this movie, I kept thinking, hey, is that the mom from Child's Play? Hey, was she in a Nightmare on Elm Street movie? Hey, is that Audrey from Little Shop of Horrors? I'm not saying that all short haired blonde women from the early 1980s look alike, but Bo, they all kind of look alike. Hollywood had a type for a while. Am, am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. There was that kind of California blonde beauty that was from like 1979 to 1990. That was every movie. Like your Courtney Thorne Smiths, your Jennifer Jason Lees, who, by the way, tried out for the role that Leah Thompson got and didn't get it. Good for her. Boy, that had to be some sweat off the brow. What, what was I in? Fast Times? Yeah, you can just take Jaws 3 and stuff it. And so Kathy... After after putting these fat dolphins into the lagoon she does she calls them fat lard i think maybe they've been depressed but that's still no excuse no because it's not. they're really packing on the pounds these are show dolphins okay I'm, I'm not here to study them and if they're too fat to jump through a flaming hoop then what use are they to me we're about to have some tuna safe dolphin if you know what i'm saying <laughs> Dennis Quaid comes over and he says, Hey, Kathy, let's go have dinner tonight with my younger brother, Sean, who's visiting from Colorado. He was in the first two Jaws movies, but we won't talk too much about him in this movie. Hey, do you have any cocaine or maybe some of that flipper fentanyl? You know how you mix that up that one time? Do you have any of that? Do you have any of that? Do you have any of that? You know, you are such a card, but you know that the last time all all those dolphin uppers went missing, they came to talk to me first. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. I'm going to take my shirt. Look, you can see my heart. You can see my heart in my chest. Look. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. You can see it beating. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh, you can. That is so interesting. How do you do that? This nameless female trainer comes over and she tells Kathy, Hey, Kathy, Cindy and Sandy don't want to go out in the lagoon and exercise. They're just sitting around eating more frosting right out of the can. <laughs> we got some Oreos too. <laughs> Kathy says, those lazy fat ass dolphins with their playtime. You know what? If those two tubs of lard don't want to exercise, it's their loss. Shitheads. Oh, it's so good. And also Dennis Quay is like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, those are, those are some crazy fish, huh? Do you think they have anything? Are they stealing anything? Do they have anything at the bottom of the thing? Maybe something and then, I don't know, white and powdery? I'm just asking. And she's like, they're mammals, dummy. They're not fish. Heck yeah, of course I know that. I mean, I work at SeaWorld. Why wouldn't I know that? During this whole encounter, Dennis Quaid and Catherine, they give each other these affectionate smooches way too many times. And they do that wind-up kiss where you make a sound before you kiss somebody. They're like, Mwah! And it happens over and over. It's the type of consistent kissing that characters do in a movie, or more accurately, a shitty sitcom to reinforce for the audience we're in love we're in love i like the scene where they go buy a puppy together they don't buy a puppy they have a puppy they do have a puppy and it's actually maybe my favorite thing about the whole movie i thought you were being serious about them buying a puppy i was like did i pass out for that <laughs> No, let's get to the other character that's maybe of note in this movie. Woo-wee! Look at here, ladies and gentlemen. Shut the hell up and listen to me, Louis Casa Jr. I got the man of the hour, Mr. Philip Fitzroyce. That's what the capital R. He's here to film us. Meet the resident day science staff. Which, that last part is actual dialogue from this movie, which helped me to understand, oh, Louis Gossett Jr. knows nothing about what he's talking about when it comes to every. Oh, I leave the science up to them small science people working with all the fish and whatnots. And I don't understand who this Fitzroyce is. I still, I've seen the movie twice in the past week, and I still don't quite have a handle on who he is or what his purpose is at the park. Not at all. He's dressed like a big game hunter on safari. I said he looked like Crocodile Dundee with a thick ascot. And he's got an Alfred with him, this guy named Tate. Who looks like he's dressed for the French resistance. <laughs> right, but their relationship is really unclear because it almost seems like paternal it's very strange and i don't understand anything about this character or what's happening with him yeah he's gonna go meet all the science folks and dennis quaid and kathy roll up on this event as it's unfolding they're on their way to have dinner yeah which means they showered and changed clothes at sea World before they went out for their night on the town which seems strange to me because i question whether or not they live at sea world maybe it's one of those foxconn or turn of the 
the century Hershey, Pennsylvania type environments. Based on the two looks I think we get of their home, it could also be an RV parked in the parking lot. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. During this whole scene, I want to point out, I really like that the filming of this movie let regular old randos at SeaWorld just walk around in the background of the production because there are multiple times in the filming of this movie where people are just staring directly at the camera (laughs) as curious onlookers. It is a real paging Mr. Herman, Mr. Pee Wee Herman. Herman moment. The lack of attention or care in this movie is staggering. It really is amazing how little of a shit that anyone gave about this movie. That's really funny. Fitzroy's our questionable big game hunter. He just turns around to the crowd of reporters and random guests at SeaWorld and he says, I'm able to combine business with pleasure, which they tell me is the secret to a happy and long life. And then Fitzroy, who has his arm around the shoulders of lewis gossett jr he stops and looks deeply into lewis gossett jr's eyes and i thought oh these two are a couple how progressive to have a gay interracial couple in jaws 3d good for you jaws 3d the movie yeah but that is 100 percent, of course not what is going on here no instead the implication is that they are both hucksters who are really capitalizing on this whole undersea kingdom nonsense that's where it says so without any further questions let's go to this free bar i keep hearing about that's filled with liquor and that my dear friend lewis gossett jr wants me to visit to get drunk follow me so as soon as they take off Uh into the movie walks the brother sean who we heard about in the previous scene where disquay was like i told you my brother was coming right i told you that i mean i would have forgotten something like that my brother's gonna be here any second hey wait a minute there's sean 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 hey come on sean come over here it's good to see you oh my god it's so good to see you oh give us a hug hey sean sean do you have any coke and Sean Brody looks like Glenn Fry gone to the rodeo. Sean leans into his brother and he's like, no, brother, uh, I don't have any cocaine. I was raised in Maine, but because all that shark nonsense, I done gone and moved to Colorado where I done picked up a cowboy accent. See my cowboy hat? Also, to complete the picture, this semester I got an incomplete and a C minus. What the hell is that? Right. Would your roommate commit suicide? What's going on, man? He's in college. My takeaway was that no of this matters this character doesn't matter in the movie at all the fact that they have the two brody brothers together is the only interesting part of that but the movie does absolutely nothing with it there's no rivalry there's nothing like that all of the stuff with sean is only necessary to get this movie to a movie length runtime we cut back over to the underwater gate the one that jaws 3d busted up earlier and our muscular guy who showed off his biceps who i thought should be in a porno shelly overman well Shelby jumps in the water. As the sun is setting, he goes to work trying to fix a chain on this underwater gate. Shelby's only wearing a diving mask and swim fins. He has no air supply to support him, Bo. Well, but he's only like two feet below the waves, Chad. I mean, he's fixing this gate and he doesn't, I don't think, necessarily have to be underwater for it because all he's doing is throwing a padlock on it, for God's sakes. I'm all out of love. I'm so lost without you. I know you were right. Believing for so long. That's my air supply, Bo. <laughs> that, that's horrifying. More so than anything in this movie. <laughs> so shelby overman is underwater and it's kind of dark and he's futzing with this chain he gets spooked by fish a real jokester taps him on the shoulder he's like what's up oh my god (laughs) it's very funny i love it in any movie and it it happens a lot in shark movies and i've seen a a ton of these where somebody gets spooked underwater when a fish goes by it's like you're in the ocean you're surrounded by fish jesus christ i thought i was gonna die if you have some ichthyphobia then what are you doing here in the first place if you're gonna get spooked every time a gold fish goes by you don't belong at SeaWorld at all Shelly Overman he's down there working on the chain and then Jaws 3D sneaks up on him and eats Shelby Overman surprise it's me Jaws 3D star of the movie chop 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 oh look I let one of your arms float away you know what I'm not in the movie very much but I just want to let you know when I am on screen it really matters I told my shark agent I've only gonna be on set for maybe three days 
And he said that was fine. He'd read the script and they could insert a smaller shark for much of the action. So goodbye for now. I got out of bed and I need to put on my face and then I'll be ready for the cameras. Diamond Zara Girl's best friend. So Jaws 3D tries to bust out to get to the ocean. I got one in the oven. And the gate, because it's been recently padlocked, holds. I've seen this movie now three times i didn't even understand that jaws 3d is in the tunnel and they closed it and then you're telling me that jaws 3d has the baby shark in the lagoon or yeah they explicitly like this is they hypothesize about that but they don't explicitly say this is what happened there is so much like vagary and obscure obfuscation Uh of the the essential elements of this movie that even when a character theorizes like i think that my Mama shark had a baby shark inside the lagoon. Uh I'm like, that is gospel. A hundred percent. That's how it happened. Because at least it's somebody explaining what happened at some point. Let's cut over to this honky tonk where Dennis Quaid, his overly affectionate girlfriend, Catherine and Sean, the younger brother are drinking. What else in the year? 1983 Michelob beer. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's a real special occasion. There's a lot to unpack in this bar. First off, it's the kind of bar where the bartender slides an unopened beer down the bar to a customer sitting at the far end of the bar. Bo, I bartended for many years. This happened exactly zero times in all of the years that I slung drinks. Yeah, I think I probably bartended about that long and I tried it one time. And it went disastrous. <laughs> well, sure, I broke a beer bottle and no. <laughs> Nobody got what they wanted, and it was really unfortunate. <laughs> this waitress in this bar, she's dressed up in this pink and black zebra striped shirt. She's wearing tight black pants and one of those rolled headbands that was normally part of a jazzercise or sweating to the oldies outfit. And our waitress, her name is Charlene, and she walks through the bar where behind her we see the early stages of what I thought was a catfight or maybe a lesbian kissing scene going on, where we see two women playfully or slightly aggressively slapping and pushing each other as onlookers in a semicircle do nothing to discourage this behavior. It turns out they're playing a game called standoff that we will talk about a bit more in a moment. But it still won't matter even then. No. This waitress Charlene, which by the way I did not realize her name was Charlene. Charlene goes to this table where our heroes are (laughs) getting loaded and she's like that man of mine shelby you seen him he's supposed to be here uh, an hour ago and i ain't seen him nowhere and disco's like what what why would i have ever seen him what i did oh oh yeah he works for me shelby works for me that's right that's right uh yeah i told him that he was gonna fix a gate yeah he's fixing a gate that's all it's no big deal look at here you tell him if i find out that he is screwing that bitch at the souvenir stand i'm gonna beat his ass tell him that for me charlene from the busted barnacle saloon he's got a ass beating coming dennis quaid her implication of their relationship relationship is at least at this point feels very casual in the sense of like well if he's catting around with another woman you tell him i'm done and it turns out that she's got this guy's entire life at her place yeah his go bag is at her place right the whole thing conjecturing about him catting around maybe so but i also i have a lot of questions about the life of shelby i have a lot of questions about charlene i think those tales will interweave dennis quaid tells her look i'm not his mom go talk to woodbury over there uh, ask him about uh you where shelby might be and also while you're over there hey ask him if he's got any cocaine by the way do you have any cocaine i don't have any i would love to buy some cocaine but if anybody here has cocaine you know i'm not gonna ask anybody that is this a bar where all the sea world workers go to get drunk every day yeah it's an industry bar it's gotta stink right oh god yeah speaking of stinking chad let's get to sean who's like boy howdy look at that pretty lady playing grab ass over there so he <laughs> excuses himself from the table while this brawny dude is being thrown off balance by a waifish leah thompson they're playing this game called standoff where two people face each other and then they place their hands together with their palms open and you either push towards someone to move them away or you release the tension in your arms to cause your opponent to lose their balance and move toward you which is exactly the type of game that no drunk would ever want to participate 
participate in because everyone who plays it in a bar is at some degree of disadvantage but if you're mutually disadvantaged then perhaps it's still even stevens and also horny you're drunk and horny in a bar and this is just an excuse to potentially fall on somebody and maybe you accidentally have sex with them chad speaking of which sean the younger brother he gets all excited he goes over there and steps in and he decides to play this game with leah thompson and her feathered hair and clothing in this scene makes her look shockingly like marty mcfly's old drunk mom at the start of back (laughs) to the future part one when she throws down that jailbird joey cake Uh uh-huh maybe next time (laughs) leah thompson says this game standoff is for beers i'm like oh so that's how she supports her alcoholism by being the most stable drunk in the bar see i don't know if it's alcoholism if you're in your 20s maybe it is but it also feels just like being like 22 sean and leah thompson start playing this rivetingly suspenseful game of last drunk standing and as the tension comes to a yawn bow sean says "Uh oh (laughs) young missy seems my fly is open and if you look down you can see my pecker so leah thompson looks down to see if she can see the this guy's cock and it turns out this wasn't true it was just a trick and leah thompson is off her game and so sean pushes leah thompson back and he wins the game free beers and most importantly leah thompson has given him his heart all in one move (laughs) oh oh is the thrilling scene over she is owed beers sean's like come on back to my table pretty lady you can meet my brother by the way if he asks you if you have any cocaine (laughs) say no even if you do and we'll do it later he takes her back to the table where it turns out that everybody there already knows each other this movie takes a real half-assed attempt unsurprisingly at doing these character beats like you would see in your jaws movie where it's like oh well let's focus on the characters that's what jaws movies are right like the shark is certainly a threat but it's about the characters right and this movie doesn't get any of that right no leah thompson says hey he used the old look at my dick trick hey what What's in this bottle? What are we drinking? Glug, glug, glug. I like that Kathy is like, oh, that silly boy. That's exactly what this one here does. Every time he's in a pickle, he just says, look at my penis. Yeah, yeah, that's what I do. That's what I say. Look at my penis. Hey, hey, Aaliyah Thompson, do you have any cocaine? What was I supposed to say? Yes, I've got some cocaine in my purse. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. She's got cocaine, she's got cocaine, she's got cocaine. As soon as, of course, he hears that he's going to score, Dennis Quaid can relax a little bit. Uh And so he starts making out with Kathy. They end up kind of leaning on each other like Forrest Gump and Bubba in Vietnam so that they don't land on the disgusting floor of this shit dive bar. Forrest Gump and Bubba is not where my mind went on that one, but I really like the image now. Sean proceeds to lay the worst pickup line ever on Leah Thompson when he says, you know, Kathy, Catherine here and my brother, they've been together for over a year and a half. But me, I'm desperate and unattached. I'm lonely and confused and I'm generous and loving to a fault. It's all in my eyes. Dude, this is totally my move. This really held a really ugly mirror up to my face as I had to really stop and evaluate the pickup lines I've been using. The movie decides to save us from its awfulness by cutting away to where we see a couple of crooks get out of their 1980s era burglar slash abduction van and they hop over this four foot tall wooden picket fence to get into SeaWorld which Bo, I don't think any major amusement park uses a four foot tall wooden picket fence as their security barrier. This feels pretty sketchy in terms of security at best. But then again, no one could have predicted that these cartoon robbers would show up with a raft. It didn't work for Farmer Brown to fend off Peter Rabbit. I don't think it's going to work here. Before we get into their business, there's a quick cutaway to the bar again. Uh huh. These are supposed to be characters moments that make everyone like these characters but we just see them sitting around drunkenly in this smoke-filled bar and the waitress comes up is like so who's got to pay this bill and everybody just points to everybody else it's a real tgi friday's mexican standoff what i really adore about this is kathy knows that it's gonna end up being her bill yeah just give it to me right you know how this goes you know this one spends all his money on on the booger sugar 
<laughs> and she's a doctor, Bo. That's why she used a technical term. We go back to SeaWorld where our two bandits who are breaking into this theme park to do something. They accidentally set off their inflatable raft and they head down to the lagoon. As they're making their way, we get a little bit of cheap 3D. And then the movie cuts back to Barnacle Seaside Watering Hole where our foursome staggers out in the middle of the night. Dennis Quaid and Catherine, they go for a walk down the beach. <laughs> <laughs> and Quaid asks Leah Thompson, hey, hey, can you give my brother a ride home? Also, did I ask you if you have any cocaine? I did. Okay. What did you say? No. Okay. Okay. Hey, do you have some cocaine since I asked you the first time? No, you still don't have any cocaine. All right, that's great. Could you get my brother home safe and sound uh, because he's kind of drunk right now? And Leah Thompson says, Bo, I'll give Sean a ride home if he comes quietly. And Sean says, oh, no way. I scream and shout. Yeah, that's what you want out of your Jaws 3D movie is a lot of cum jokes. <laughs> it's like the one in Guardians of the Galaxy where you're like, whoa, I wasn't expecting a Jackson Pollock ejaculate joke in this movie. Thought we were here to watch a cartoon raccoon shoot a space laser. He's making a comical remark regarding how he has an orgasm, which one assumes is all by himself because there is no way this goofball has ever convinced a woman to let him put his penis inside her vagina. He is only deposited in that hat of his. What time of day is it at this point? Like 1, 2 a.m.? Yeah, they've been up since, what, 6.30, 7 a.m.? That's what the cocaine's for, Bo. They're leaning on 24 hours at this point of the all-nighter, and they're going for round two or three, depending on how you want to look at it, where there's the moonlit stroll on the beach with Kathy and Dennis Quaid. But Leah Thompson asks Sean, hey, let's go swimming. And Sean says, well, young Missy, I hate the ocean. And she says, do you like lagoons? If I knew what one was, maybe I'd like it. Did I say that I got an incomplete this semester? I got a gentleman C. I got an incomplete on basic comprehension. Dennis Quaid and Kathy, they're walking down the beach and Kathy says, why doesn't your younger brother come and visit us more often in his delightfully charming cowboy hat and that hilarious cowboy accent he has for no reason? And Dennis Quaid says, do you have any cocaine? I'm just kidding. Just kidding. But seriously, do you have any cocaine? No. Okay. Hey, do you remember when I told you about that shark attack we had when I was a kid in Amity? You remember that story? Well, actually, it was two different stories. I was on two separate occasions where one shark attack went after my dad and almost killed him and these other kids. And it actually almost killed this kid. I knew, in fact, it actually did kill this one kid I knew when I was a kid. But anyway, a few years later, we were out on the water and this other shark showed up and it tried to kill us. That might have slipped your mind. Do you have any cocaine? Did you say yes or no? So Sean goes to school in Colorado because he hates the ocean, but not me. I love the ocean because being here in Florida gives me so much more cocaine from traffickers coming up from my mambi. It's fantastic. Someone like me who really enjoys cocaine so much, I just love cocaine. Do you have any cocaine? Did I ask you that already? Do you know sometimes it just washes up on the beach? That's why I got this job in the first place, so I could be near the beach. Let's walk down the beach. We might find some cocaine. What's that over there? Is that cocaine? No, it's just sand. And then she says, listen, mister, I know all this cocaine talk just means that you've got some news. What happened with that job in Venezuela? You're not going to believe it. I got a call from Venezuela. They want to come down to work for them. They have said they had a lot of cocaine, and they want to come down and do a lot of cocaine for them. And I'm like, hey, I guess I should go down there and learn Spanish so that I can do a lot of cocaine. Don't ask stock cocaine. Call me. Say, dice, Ed Asner is a hoot. Hey, am I right, Catherine? <laughs> hey, do you have any cocaine? Have I asked you about the cocaine yet? I like the joke they were just for me kathy who is happy for him you know it's like i knew you were gonna get that job with the cartel how long do you think you're gonna be gone dennis quaid and dennis quaid says uh, i don't know i don't know maybe a couple of days maybe a year and a half why don't you just give up your life and follow me i know you're a doctor and all but maybe we can go to venezuela and we can get a whole bunch of cocaine it doesn't get even than that Catherine. you know what i like cocaine you know like, da -da 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 -da. cocaine cocaine <laughs> follow me with some cocaine who do you like that song i love that song da -da 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 -da. cocaine cocaine it's all about cocaine and then right Catherine, you and me cocaine do you have any cocaine i love cocaine Cocaine. You know, I was just thinking as you were ranting about your addiction that maybe I don't know if I'm ready to just give up everything here. I've still got six months here at SeaWorld and then I've got that contract to raise more dolphins in Vancouver. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I just don't know, Dennis Quaid. You know what? I'm going to go hit the slopes in Venezuela and do a lot of skiing. Coke is a real thing. I love Coke. Who wants to get some Coke? Let's go. Coke is a real thing. Cocaine, cocaine. Do you like that song? Cocaine. And so Leah Thompson and Sean are hanging out on the beach, like traipsing through some waist high colored barriers or something. Bo, they are in SeaWorld, a major theme park, and playing this game of adult hide and seek. How did they get in? Why? 
why are they there if they're drunk and they're gonna hook up go back to her place why have sex in a bed chad when you could have awkward uncomfortable sex half in the water and half in sand oh my god in disgusting swamp water it's sea world water that is nothing but dolphin shit in urine just by skinny dipping you've got sepsis that's to start with and if you actually penetrate, that's eight different kinds of venereal disease you're going to get. And some of them only fishborne. Your baby's going to be a swamp thing. That's a given. The question is, is it a good swamp thing or a bad swamp thing? There is no question that it's got to be a swamp thing. Leah Thompson starts to disrobe and strips down to her bra and panties and she kisses Sean. And she's like, come on, get in the water. And he's like, oh, young Missy, I don't go in the water, but oh, boing, I got a boner. I might have sex. So they <laughs> traips out into the water to make out and he follows the north star aka his penis directly into waist high water let's go back to those two burglars who don't matter in our movie they're now out floating in a raft in the lagoon which i'm like are they in the same lagoon that leah thompson and sean brody are in tentatively having sex yeah but like in the middle or something uh, like they're there we learn to get coral is that code for drugs it's gotta be dennis quaid is stash them in the galleon and he's got twenty thousand dollars wrapped up in saran wrap they've got the package of only mildly stomped on blow one of the burglars says if we go down and get the good coral a guy in miami will give us 200 bucks for it you're in a theme park collecting coral for 200 bucks chad <laughs> like the juice is not worth the squeeze on this one if you get caught that's got to be some kind of federal crime you're swimming around in waters with like endangered species and stuff for 200 dollars in coral you could literally go 80 yards further down the beach and find all the coral you want for free dennis quaid and Catherine, they show up at sea world at night and they find leah thompson's convertible jeep parked near the lagoon and because dennis quaid and Catherine are still drunk they giggle and they tippy toe walk like shaggy and scooby-doo making their way from one palm tree to another until they finally find themselves at a close proximity to the lagoon and dennis quaid flashes a a spotlight on his younger brother and leah thompson as they're making out in the water gross dennis quaid barks through this electric bullhorn you there in the water naked enough to still be in a pg movie you're trespassing on sea world property come out with your hands up all the way do you have any cocaine as soon as he hears that sean's like wait a second most police officers don't ask me for cocaine is that you dennis quaid bo he says it's okay my brother works here which is <laughs> right. the stupidest thing anyone could say at any moment until leah thompson chimes in i'm on the ski team that doesn't absolve you from trespassing not to mention your state of undress and amorous embrace in water that's filled with all manner of fish shit and tourism spit just because you work at a place doesn't mean you have a stake in the place that allows you to free roam you're not gonna see the guy who takes the tickets at disneyland strolling around in disney corporate like no 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 i'm part of the disney family don't even worry about it i threw a tent up in Frontierland. i live in the swiss family robinson house now Catherine ruins this whole bit by taking the bullhorn and saying dennis quaid let me have a turn at the fun <clears throat> do you two turkeys have any identification on you which just gives up the whole stupid bit to begin with and everyone has a big laugh and this is all so poorly executed and has nothing to do with anything in this movie to advance the plot or provide any additional layers to the character which is to your point Miller, is what made the original jaws movie so incredible jaws isn't about a shark attacking people in a summer beach town that's what happens but that's not what the movie is about but in jaws 3d nothing happens and it's about nothing <laughs> right the characters are so unlikable or at best neutral dennis quaid i think comes off as a big jerk for most of the movie yep kathy is just such a non-entity who doesn't really seem to have any agency in it the brother is equally unlikable and leah thompson wavers between aggressively horny and just pushy i hate saying that because it sounds like i'm painting her as 
as being an aggressive woman that just comes on too strong or something but she's not she's just like the sex pot of the movie that all she wants to do is have sex with sean or any beefcake she runs across and get drunk we are well over a third of the way through this movie and none of the characters in this film are aware that there is any threat of a shark whatsoever hell we've only seen the shark eat a fish which is what sharks do and we saw a guy's arm get chopped off and float in the water which with the right lawyer bow and in front of the right jury could be argued that this arm was severed by that faulty underwater gate closure the judiciary being what it is these days that's definitely going to go in against the shark let's go back to our two burglars one of them goes into the water and then the other one gets yanked into the water by a cord or something and then the inflatable boat gets punctured and it gets pulled underwater which it's implied that our burglars were eaten by a shark i didn't even have to be on set that day they just faked it all it's what they use special effects for that's just good effects work i like practical effects I think they age so much better. The next morning, we wake up and we're in the home of Dennis Quaid and Catherine, where Dennis Quaid is feeding their puppy basset hound that we mentioned earlier, which is shocking that these two have a dog and a puppy. You can't go out drinking on the beach when you got a dog like that. You got to take it for a walk. You got to spend time with it. Otherwise, you're raising a monster. You don't have to, Chad. (laughs) This place has an odor. There is no (laughs) doubt about that. You can see it in this movie. The stink line are visible every scene there's a pig pen laying just below the camera frame <laughs> and i like the fact that dennis quaid is holding the dog's ears while it eats it's uh his girlfriend that had a little too much to drink her boyfriend broke up with her and now she's really blowing it out mm-hmm. i like i like that quite a bit Catherine leaves for work saying dennis quaid i'm off to do aquatic doctor stuff but be a dear and leave some water on the floor for our dog named be sure you leave the toilet bowl seat up sean and dennis quaid they sit down because they're both hung over and they start chit-chatting over a very robust breakfast of eggs bacon toast wheaties tropicana orange juice coffee it's all part of a well-balanced breakfast bow oh that's dennis quaid was up all night cooking he's <laughs> You know, he was all on the toot. He never slept. Yeah. I gotta cook, gotta cook, gotta clean, gotta clean. You don't know. Oh my God, oh my God. I've got to go in to do my taxes. I know it's the middle of the year, but I still need to do my taxes. I can prepay. I can prepay. Don't you ever sleep, Dennis Quay. Not for weeks. Not for weeks. <laughs> and during this scene, Sean tells his older brother, Dennis Quay, he says, concern it. You know, I was this close to doing it in the water last night. And I'm like, you know what? You could have left off in the water last night and your statement still holds true. And then Sean kind of breaks his older brother's balls a bit and he's like you know what admit it big brother you done went and messed me up real good when i was a youngin and then dennis quaid says yeah yeah i guess i messed you up blah 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 hey do you have any cocaine these two don't even discuss what happened to them as kids with the shark attacks it's completely glossed over that in fact this conversation just when you might get an actual human moment between these characters yep calvin bouchard calls up dennis quaid he's like so you know uh we got a problem down here at the sea world and we need you to come on in and take care of some dennis quaid business on dennis quaid side of this is like who lewis gossett jr my boss uh yeah okay men are working on it yes sir all right do you have any cocaine no all right i'm just asking for a friend all right goodbye click sean i gotta go to work yeah and off he goes and so we cut to the asshole dolphins Uh who are just jumping up and down as fitzroyce is taking pictures while kathy and and her crew are training these dolphins who are just like look we can get up we got big ups we jump high we're not as fat as you called us Catherine's like look look at these fat tubs of lard get those two lazy mammals in here and i'll shame them into losing a few pounds the way my mother did me when i was a child you there are dolphins i'm not gonna dignify by calling you by your names you fat asses <laughs> we can remember everything <laughs> Fitzroyce. Remember him? He's in our movie, Bo. He strolls down to the tank and she's like, oh my God, are you looking for somebody in particular there, Philip Fitzroyce? And he says, oh, I'm just looking for someone in authority. Not you. You're a woman. So clearly you have no authority and cannot help me. I'm actually marine biologist slash supermodel, Catherine, who, by the way, went to a conference with you in Helsinki, if you don't remember that. Ah, yes. I'm Philip Fitzroyce, huffing dollars worth of money bag the third 
and she asked him about uh, like he rammed a boat with a whaling vessel and uh, she's like why did you do that and he and he says oh well it got in the way of my shot and at this point i still can't tell if he means a picture or if he was trying to shoot that whale because he's always dressed like he's about to take donald trump jr on some special big game trip they don't clarify what he does at all is he a photographer is he a naturalist is he a big game hunter it doesn't really matter at the end of the day so no but he shows up to sea world with grenades chat well that's later but he brought them with that's the thing <laughs> he was like if i'm going to sea world i gotta take my grenades he looks over to Catherine and he says say why don't you and i go out and have drinks and then have dinner and then have sex and Catherine says mm, no i don't think so look if you've not heard i'm really in love with dennis quaid in this movie i love him the way he loves cocaine and that is a bond that is impossible to break okay in fact because he's doing all that cocaine he can do all of those things that you want to do but at once we cut to dennis quaid pretending to get measurements off of a pipe or something and security at sea world bow has to be non-existent because the waitress charlene from the rusty barnacle bar and grill she shows up with a go bag full of belongings of her now ex-boyfriend who didn't show up at her apartment last night and charlene says he don't sleep in, he don't live in. You tell Shelby Overman he can take a flying leap at a rolling donut on a gravel driveway. You hear that? I think that sounds like code words for having sex with a prostitute who lives in a trailer park. It's a step too far, Chad. Take a flying leap at a rolling donut, fine. Rolls off the tongue a little bit, but the on a gravel driveway, it's just putting too long a tail on that kite. <laughs> when she throws his stuff at Dennis Quaid, like, you tell him to take all this stuff. Dude, it is his passport, uh -huh. his driver's license, his credit card, his birth certificate, his social security card. Pawn tickets. Pawn tickets that guy can tell a story or two Bo. <laughs> dennis quaid is like oh he's probably just sleeping it off somewhere it's in some car he's just all, all boozed up that's again a much more interesting movie of the life of shelby who may or may not be sleeping with multiple women is pawning some stuff to get by and probably is battling some alcohol problems <laughs> like it's the wrestler but at sea world you know it did us quite dig a little deeper in that go back he's gonna find a loaded gun yeah there's definitely a gun involved shelby over street or whatever he's <laughs> got a gun he's got a couple one of them he actually bought legally the other one let's say was a bit of a trophy <laughs> he inherited it yeah well that's one way to put it chad the previous owner certainly wasn't going to be using it anymore <laughs> did you recognize charlene the waitress in this movie Bo? no who is she she's portrayed by dolores starlene who was the actress from summer rental and she was the woman who showed her naked breast to john candy oh yeah she only had two movie roles Bo: this and her role in summer rental so you Bo ransdell have seen the full oeuvre of Miss Dolores Starlene within the past few months. I wonder if Letterboxd has that as a category. I like that Dennis Quaid provides these words of comfort when he says, uh, don't worry, Charlene, he's probably just curled up drunk somewhere. And when I find yeah. him, he's going to be in trouble. Now get back home and we'll call you when we hear from him. Cut to Dennis Quaid and Catherine getting into a prop submarine that is better suited for a James Bond movie. They are going underwater in the lagoon to look for a missing co-worker that is presumed dead. <laughs> oh, Oh, yes. The guy didn't show up at work. Well, we better go troll the lagoon to yeah. find his corpse. It's shifted from a rescue to a recovery mission, Chad. <laughs> this submersible, it, first of all, it feels like it should be a bigger deal in the movie because it's really only in this scene. Also, as soon as they start plumbing the depths of this 40 feet of water, <laughs> yes, the dolphins who have been picked on this whole movie for being fat just swim <laughs> alongside him like, hey, hey, you suckers can't even swim on your own. Hey, hey. <laughs> and then just like do a flyby maverick style uh-huh then chad maybe my favorite shot of the movie let's hear it is when the submersible makes a little turn near the undersea kingdom uh-huh and the chroma key washes out the bottom of the submersible okay but that was just okay for this movie <laughs> are you talking about the shot from inside underwater headquarters no it, you see it's a shot of the submersible and it just tilts like to port yes and as it tilts up you see the underside of the submersible but it's totally chroma keyed out it's <laughs> shocking chad the fact that like this wouldn't pass in a homemade youtube video these days and this made it into theaters as a jaws movie this scene gives us a whole bunch of hokey 3d effects as 
the submarine is floating around. Dennis Quaid and Catherine, they drift around for a bit looking for their dead co-worker based on a hunch. They say that if, if Shelby's body is in fact in this lagoon, it will have washed into the center because of all the drifts and tides and whatnot. He didn't show up to work and their first thought is he's dead in the lagoon. Look, he was drunk when I asked him to fix the gate. The chances of <laughs> him dead are, you know, 35, 40%. I mean, it's not a hundred, but there's a good chance we're going to find him in this lagoon. Dennis Quaid and Catherine, they get out of the submarine and they go swim around this sunken ship exhibit to see if the corpse of their missing drunk employee is jammed in there somewhere. And we get more 3D trickery from a pirate skeleton. And the asshole dolphins come out too. Where like, yeah. When Dennis Quaid gets out there, just like, <laughs> fuck you. And they <laughs> scare Dennis Quaid. And as soon as that happens, Catherine's like, yeah, they've been kind of jerks for like two days now they've been acting weird as hell Catherine and dennis quaid make their way inside this prop ship that's viewable by guests in the undersea kingdom once this opens up to the public and then out of nowhere Bo, a shark crashes into this pirate ship prop and then the shark swims away at high speed because the film footage is sped up to make it get away much more quickly than it normally did right it looks terrible, Bo. It's, it, it's it's an ending of Benny Hill. How yakety sax didn't play is beyond. Then the dolphins are like, all right, fine, we'll come get you. <laughs> and they swim back and Dennis Quaid and Catherine just grab their fins uh -huh. and these dolphins take off with the shark hot on their heels yep. or fins as it were. Kathy loses her grip and I don't know how they're communicating underwater because they've got scuba, like the oxygen thing in their mouth, but they're talking and <laughs> Kathy is like, hey, come back for me, Dennis Quaid. And he's like, fuck that I'm out of here. Does not even try to release the dolphin that's carrying him to safety. It's up to the other dolphin that's like, hey, all right, fine, I'll do it. Even though you call me fat, I'll still do it. Are we really the unsung heroes of this movie? <laughs> and he comes back, Kathy grabs him again, and then they shoot off away from the shark. They make it into some kind of sub lagoon or something. Who knows? Where they close another gate that sure. this shark just runs into while Dennis Quaid and Kathy make it onto this dock and breathe heavily on top of each other and the guy who's at the dock is just like so what's going on here like you guys just came in here like hairs on fire asses is catching style with these dolphins so what's going on with the shark i don't know i don't know what the hell is that hey do you have any cocaine no I'm just watching, I'm security for SeaWorld. I'm just making sure nobody's screwing around in the lagoon at night. Also, I found a raft and a van. Have you guys seen anything <laughs> maybe van related? There's a naked guy over in the orca tank with his cock bit off. It's been a weird day. I'm telling you, I, you can't swing a cat in this place without hitting somebody jumping into a tank with something. So we cut over to some restaurant at SeaWorld, which I'll bet they serve seafood there, Bo. It's all burgers and dogs. At the table is Louis Gossett Jr., Fitzroyce, and his French resistance male companion. The SeaWorld employee walks over to interrupt this dinner, and Louis Gossett Jr. tells this employee, Look at here, we have a dinner. All right, this better be important. This here is my house. All right, these are my guests. And the employee leans over and says, I'm sir, Dennis Quaid and Dr. Catherine, what's her name? You know, his girlfriend who's always kissing him all the time. They were chased by a shark out in the lagoon. Louis Gossett Jr. says, Oh, I say, I say, that is important. Gentlemen, oh, you best come with me. Come on, Miss Your Fiscaraldo. It's time for you to own your keep. <laughs> so they go to the lagoon where Dennis Quaid <laughs> is showing off this busted smaller gate instead of the bigger one. Fitzroyce is like, you know, I have a great idea. If there is actually a shark in these waters, why, how about you allow me to kill it? We can film the whole thing. I can promise you that me murdering a great white shark at SeaWorld will get you media coverage. Catherine is having none of this. She's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is SeaWorld. It's not Slaughter World. This shark that chased us had to be like 10 feet long. It's a great white. It tried to eat us. Dennis Quaid is chain smoking to beat the band behind her. And he's like, that's crazy. I mean, uh, look, the whole th thing is crazy. But let me tell you something. I've dealt with these things before. These sharks, they're, they're man eaters. How 
about we just let this guy kill it? I think that's a great idea. Did somebody else say it was a good idea? I think it's a great idea. Everybody seems to agree. And I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You're looking at me and you're looking at the scene and you're looking at my shirt and you're thinking, oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe how much sweat is pouring out of his armpits. It's distracting, Dude. isn't it? He's got these giant pits of sweat that are coming all the way down to the side of his hips. How could anyone sweat this much? And I got an answer for you. It's one thing, cocaine, cocaine. That's why I sweat so much. I have so much cocaine in my body. It pours out through my armpits and it causes everyone around me to not be able to pay attention to anything that's going on because they're wondering, am I going to be able to even maintain my ability to stand up because so much liquid is pouring out of my armpits? Do you all have any more cocaine? Did you know that this lagoon was empty before I started sweating? That's so weird, isn't it? it yeah, dude, it's amazing. It is a healthy, healthy sweat stain under each pit. It's like the amount of piss in Billy Madison's pants when he does the noble thing of splashing water on his crotch. Imagine that much moisture under each arm yes and meanwhile lewis gossett jr is like well that does sound pretty good taking pictures of you killing that tail shark kathy steps in and is like but wait a second you could get one big payment Aww. from from this movie about killing the shark or Aww. we could Aww. capture the shark uh-huh we get pictures of that. Uh-huh. Then we get pictures of us nursing it back to hell. Uh-huh. Then we put it on display and it is recurring revenue for years. Uh-huh. And even Fitzroy's is like, well, when you put it that way, I do have a stake in this, don't I? Oh, good. Yes. Well, then I'll take a percentage. Let's all listen to this woman I hope to have sex with in the future. Let's do her plan now. Then there is a mirror scene scene almost from orca in which a dude is just prepping some dope for the shark yeah but it's 3d it's coming at you bo squirt 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 and it's kind of the same thing where he's like look i had to kind of estimate how much dope to use so you might want to try this out on a dog or something first so they've got <laughs> kathy all draped in this chainmail diving suit and she's gonna go down with fitzroy's who by the way is wearing the grenades that we mentioned earlier he says Catherine here will be fine in her suit covered in anti-shock chain mail she might feel a little squeeze at most maybe a poke maybe a little prick an injection of excitement from the pond wink wink nudge nudge also i have these brightly colored yellow hun grenades if we get into a spot of trouble all we have to do is pull the pin on one of these yellow hand grenades and it will cause an explosion suitable for blowing up a shark of any size very good movie's ending has successfully been telegraphed in let us go into the water shall we well before they could go in kathy's like no 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 grenades Lewis Gossett Jr., where do you stand on grenades? Oh, well, I guess no grenades when you put it that way about cracking the acrylic down there in the water and whatnot. So they end up taking this <laughs> pontoon boat slash lighting rig out to the middle of the lagoon. And then they turn on some lights under the boat as well. And Kathy and Fitzroy go into the water. Curse splash. Yeah. While Dennis Quaid and his group are trying to find some cocaine and also letting the audience know through a series of very stilted lines that they only have one shot to dope this shark for some reason right. and that you got to hit it behind the dorsal fin or middle of the back. All right. Yeah. Like anything in this movie matters at all, but fine. The only thing that matters in the whole movie is sharks in the lagoon. Fitzroy has a grenade. The end of movie. Right. Anyway, in between that, Fitzroy and Kathy are underwater and he's kind of screwing around with this camera. And while he's doing that, sure enough, this shark comes along and just grabs Kathy yeah. and tries to eat her. And Fitzroy <laughs> is like, well, my heavens. Yeah, let me take my knife and stab, stab, stab in the nose of this shark. So he kind of drives the shark off and it surfaces a little bit. And there's a certain nod to the original jaws as we see dennis quaid with this like harpoon crossbow thing and the shark coming across the bow and he has to shoot the the shark but at first he's like oh my god oh my god i left the safety on oh my god okay okay safety's off now shoot and he shoots this harpoon and it, and sure enough it hits the shark and kind of tags it with this red balloon and dennis quaid's like balloons balloons i don't know that's heroin I, I just want the cocaine but the harpoon being fired does come at you in 3d bow in that way it is very much like 
like Friday the 13th 3D, which also had a harpoon gun being fired at the camera. Fitzroyce and his French male companion, they're down there filming all this. And once they come up, Louis Gossett Jr. calls out over the loudspeaker, Did you get the film? Did you get the footage? And all that pretty scare for me up here. I'm glad I wasn't down under the water. Huh? I like that Discway is like, yeah, yeah, we're all fine down here. I mean, yeah, I'm fine. Kathy's fine. Fitzroyce is fine. Tate's fine. The other people who don't have names here are fine. The lights are fine. Yeah, everybody's fine. But yeah, your film's fine too, jerk. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I, how are you? That looked dangerous. I was here watching all those cameras there, and it looked like that shark was going to eat your girlfriend. Oh, wee. I tell you what, she is a pretty little thing. You slap some barbecue sauce on her, I eat that bottom. We cut to the next day, and Dennis Quaid shows up at this tank of water, still high on cocaine, and quite possibly some of that shark tranquilizer that he pumped into the shark that we now find in the tank of water with Kathy, and she's trying to nurse this shark back to health with this nameless trainer, and then Dennis Quaid just hops into the water with her, because she's his girlfriend, and he's high on cocaine and shark tranquilizers, and they're going to nurse this shark back to health and then suddenly the shark just snaps to life and starts swimming around in this tank and it's a real magical moment kathy makes it clear like hey don't do anything to traumatize this shark like shoot it with a shark tranquilizer gun and abduct it from the lagoon in which it was born let it see pornography too early or violent imagery (laughs) let's let it socialize properly maybe some pre-shark k we then cut to some footage of sea world opening up the undersea kingdom attraction and everything is back to normal, Bo. Louis Gossett Jr., he comes over to Dennis Quaid and he says, Look a here. What happened to that lazy worker what disappeared a few scenes back? You will find his dead body down in the lagoon. If not, when he show up, you fire his ass. Or I'm holding you responsible. Hey, no, no, wait, 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 wait. Let's not fire somebody just because they go missing for a couple of days and are on a bender, okay? I mean, who doesn't do that? Everybody does that every now and again. So uh, you just let me take care of this. You listen up here. I'm Louis Gossett Jr. I run this park. By the way, where is that great white shark? what we caught last night no matter go find that shark put it in tank number six and let everybody go look at it yeehaw by three o'clock i want to make sure that i can get in line and see that shark swimming around in that tank maybe eating some fish maybe it was popping his little tail up in the water giving all the kiddies a little special splashy i want to make sure that's ready to go by the sundown we are then treated to footage of a ski show at sea world in the lagoon where we see the pyramid skiers we saw earlier doing their thing there's this this duo of skiers dubbed the Silver Bullets. They're called that, Bo, because they're always drunk on Coors Light. <laughs> I thought it was because they killed werewolves. Can it be both, Bo? I suppose You've it taught me that people are complicated. There's nuance. We contain multitudes. We are both water skiers and werewolf killers, each of us. We need to write that movie. What would you call it? I would just call it Silver Bullet. But then you would think it was like the alien-style sequel to Silver Bullet, in which a bunch of reverend werewolves were now attacking. Now we got something, Chad. Right, do what you just said. All right, no, I'm on board. It Because it works on so many levels. It's both the beer the guys are drinking, it's what you use to kill the Reverend Werewolves, and it's what they're called as a ski team. <laughs> Let's get the Sci-Fi Network or Netflix on the line right now. <laughs> yeah, cut this out. We can't leave this in. We cut over to Sean, the younger brother. He shows up and pulls Leah Thompson aside, who was performing in the ski show, and he says, well, hey there, young Missy. Could we spend some time together? I was thinking we could have sex. You know, maybe you and me. And Leah Thompson says, yeah, that sounds great. Let's go ride the bus bumper boats that's my equivalent of sitting on the washing machine when it's in the spin cycle we cut to people walking down this path into the undersea kingdom entrance and we get more gratuitous 3d effects with a dragon tongue that's part of the entrance into this exhibit it all kind of has like a trickle of traffic into this place it doesn't really seem all that popular in my opinion as a new featured attraction the movie then takes us underwater and we see people ooing and eyeing as they walk through the glass tunnels that show props off in the distance in the lagoon and there are fishes and maybe some sunken trash where people threw it in the water from up above there's the haunted house part of it that i like because the mori eel comes out at you and also a tentacle just grabs this girl and won't let go and that's the part of it where i think that's against the rules i don't think you can do that without a waiver i think that teenage boys would destroy these props in less than four hours of park operation I'm surprised that Leah Thompson hasn't made a move on one of these tentacles already. <laughs> we cut over to Dennis Quaid and Catherine talking about their future together. Who cares?
Rogers. Dennis Quaid says, look, I gotta get back to work. I gotta get back to work. Okay, I gotta get back to work. I gotta go find some more cocaine. And Catherine is left just sitting all by herself. And then she hears quietly on this loudspeaker, Attention, SeaWorld shoppers. You can now see a great white shark in tank number six. The only great white shark alive in captivity. And she's like, that's weird. I have a great white. Wait a second. It goes running to this tank where they have moved this great white shark that immediately goes belly up in the waters. Blah, dead. Can we talk about the sign out in front of this exhibit for a moment? <laughs> the notebook paper magic marker great white here sign. It is this hastily spray painted sign tacked to a random piece of wood that says SeaWorld exclusive great white shush sh- shark. The fonts are all different sizes. They're at crooked angles it looks like something you see on the side of the road saying we buy houses any condition with an area code that is not in the state in which you live i mean that's representative chad of the production design of this movie as a whole i know that's supposed to look cheap but it doesn't necessarily look substantially cheaper than anything else that you're seeing when the shark dies it's kind of sad but then off in the distance you hear a kid crying which is kind of funny oh children's tears Catherine just leaves in disgust. Fitz Royce is there. He offers no comfort. He doesn't even say anything. He just looks at her like, I guess somehow I'm partially responsible. Anyway, would you like to have sex yet? Leah Thompson and Sean, they climb into a bumper boat that is clearly meant for only one adult, and they speed off into the lagoon. We cut over to the underwater kingdom where tourists are looking at fish, and they're like, oh, hey, look, there's a blue fish. Hey, there's a gray fish. It's pretty exciting. And then, Bo, Uh the rotting corpse of Shelby Overman floats up into view, and this teenage girl starts screaming, and then one girl gets her face smashed up against the viewing window, either by a stranger or maybe a frenemy of hers, and she's just shitting her pants with fear, looking at this rotting body in front of her. This scene should have gone on for so much longer, but unfortunately, the movie cuts away to Dennis Quaid and Catherine, who are now with the body of... Of Shelly Overman, who was pulled out of the lagoon and is laid on some sort of medical table for confirmation of Corb's identity. I think it's telling that they called Dennis Quaid and not Charlene. <laughs> he's got the go bag now. <laughs> right, he's got the passport and all. Uh, that's going to help when he needs a new identity pretty soon. I like when he throws back the sheet to look at the body. He immediately just starts vomiting. Then Kathy is like, hey, let me take a look. <laughs> he's like, no, Kathy, you don't want to see this. I'm telling you. It is the inverse of how much I love cocaine is how much I hate that. Really? Well, now I gotta see it. Right. It's a real, like, it, what did you say you smelled? Let me take a whip. <laughs> oh, oh my God. That is terrible. Kathy goes up to the body and they pull the sheet back. And you think, Chad, somebody would have brushed the crabs off at least. No. But no. <laughs> There's a crab on this dummy head. There's uh, some kind of worm crawling out of its mouth. I respect the movie for going schlocky for a second. And if there had been like 50% more of this, it would have been way better. So Dennis Quaid and Kathy, they run off with a, oh my God, not sure exactly why. We cut over to Louis Gossett Jr. Who's getting drunk with Fitz Royce and his French resistance male companion. And they're in this underwater lounge that has floor to ceiling viewing windows into the water of the lagoon the phone rings and it's for lewis gossett jr who answers the phone with a cello <laughs> yeah what about the pumps you just shut down number one and you switch to number two you tell dennis quaid to get down here on the double you hear while that is going on fitzroyce is admiring some sharks outside the neptune room and he says i wonder how do you keep all these sharks from going into the rest of the lagoon and you know eating all the guests and he says, well, now that is some, that's some real science right there. That is a curtain of bubbles that we call marine segregation. <laughs> yeah, I know. That is uncomfortable when I use that word. You call it what? We call it uh, shark crow laws that, that keeps them sharks from the peoples. Uh, also keeps them from voting. Is that why I saw all those people out front with the Shark Lives Matters signs and t-shirts? Now, 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 I would, I would say that, uh, guest lives matter as well, but yeah, uh, the shark, the sharks are treated fine now. The, they got their own schools. They got, they got their own water fountain for their gills. You know, sharks like to, they get water to their gills. That's how they breathe. And, and let me tell you something right now. All right. 
in SeaWorld, we do not teach critical shark theory. Now, we we went to the shark board of education, and we made sure that when they read the history books, there ain't no old sharks kept in SeaWorld or nothing. There ain't, ain't, no, ain't no killer whales kept against their will. Now, I don't agree with it. I think that is fishist. About this time, <laughs> Catherine and Dennis Quaid, they show up at this lounge where Louis Gossett Jr. and Fitzroy, they're sucking down cocktails. And Catherine comes in and she says, Shelly Overman was killed by a shark with a bite radius three feet wide. Louis Gossett Jr. does a full on, what you talking about, Kathy? <laughs> Fitzroy <laughs> says, well, that would mean the shark was at least 35 feet in length. The one that we captured and subsequently saw die in front of Paul Guest, was only 10 feet in length. And Catherine says, It appears that you can do basic math, you imbecile. Also, our shark, the dead one you just mentioned, and that you moved to the viewing tank, had all of its teeth. It's a baby. It didn't kill Shelly Overman. Its mother did. And then, Bo. Yeah. Lewis Gossett Jr. gives the most Lewis Gossett Jr. line delivery in this whole movie. When he says... You talk about some damn shark mama. <laughs> Man. <laughs> and once they establish that there is a giant shark, a Jaws 3D, in fact, on the loose. Yes. Everybody goes running except for Lewis Gossett Jr., who calls up the headquarters in the Undersea Kingdom. And is like, hey, is my nephew there? Put my nephew on the phone. Hey, listen. Lewis Gossett Jr., Jr. I need you to get everybody out of that Undersea Kingdom. And I need you to seal up to paw. Now, don't ask me a bunch of questions about giant sharks right now, because I got no answers. I don't know how to do that. I, I'm not sure. Listen, if you want to take the good Lewis Gossett Jr. Jr. name yes. and carry it with, around with you. Of course I do. With my blessing, uh, you are going to seal up this paw. Okay. Can I be in Dickstown too? No, you may not. That is for me and James Woods and Oliver Platt. Now, I never met Bruce Dunn. He would not meet me. I tried to corner him and get him to sign an autograph because of how much I love silent running. Well, he is a big proponent of critical Dern theory, and he would not meet me. He also did not care for enemy minds. Lewis Gossett Jr. goes on to say, That baby mama gave birth out in the ocean, and it was the baby shark what swam into the park. Look, somehow this is your fault, Dennis Quaid. And then Catherine says, No, Shelly Ober was killed in the park. The baby was caught inside the park. The mother shark is inside the park. And wouldn't you know it, Jaws 3D shows up right behind our movie's cast as they are having this conversation in this underwater lounge. Well, look at who we got here. Oh, wow. It looks like an elegant room. Hey, everybody. It's me, Jaws 3D. I heard you were talking about me and my child. Has anybody seen him? He went out last night and he never came home. I'm starting to get a little bit worried about him. You know, I always thought I would be happy when he left the nest or the ocean, but it turns out I miss him because a shark son is a girl's best friend. <laughs> so everybody in the lounge just collectively shits their pants and starts freaking out seeing this shark coming towards them. Yeah, him. it's the airplane like throwing the baby up into the air. It is mass hysteria. I like that Dennis Quaid, who is running on nothing but a speedball of synthetic heroin and Colombian cocaine, he just darts out of the building and heads off to the ski show that's happening in the lagoon at this very minute. Then we cut over to Sean, the younger brother, and Leah Thompson remember them they're in our movie they're toot tooting around in this bumper boat and they get hit while sitting still in the water by this fat guy it's a real dick move we head back over to dennis quaid who is running along his heart is clearly about to explode in his chest as he makes his way across sea world he commandeers a golf cart that is transporting boxes of popcorn and all of these boxes of popcorn are just open up to the world on top they're not closed at all which i would never eat that and as dennis Quaid speeds away. All of this popcorn falls out of the back of the golf cart, hits the ground, and children and adults alike scramble to pick up the popcorn off the ground and eat it like it's candy from a pinata. Yeah, they're, if they're hunting hard enough, there's going to be a golden ticket at the bottom of it. <laughs> the best part of Dennis Quaid requisitioning this golf cart from the popcorn guy uh -huh. is that it takes him maybe 45 feet before he drops it on its side, going up a gentle slope. <laughs> 
Yeah, he flips it over. Also, this movie needs a scene where they scream for people to get out of the water. So it appears that the movie makers created a fake beach at this theme park where people are splashing out in the lagoon. And then Fitzroy's French assistant male companion, he runs down there and ends up punching a fat guy who doesn't comply with the shouts to get out of the water, which is pretty good. That's pretty fun. Then the skiers, the big set piece of the movie, kind of. This is a pretty good Jaws moment. Yeah, you wish there were more of it and there were more of a body count but yes the fin pops up behind the skiers one of the girls being twirled around on someone's shoulders spots this fin is like shush shark the choreography of all of the women turning around and seeing this giant shark fin that's what you're paying for in a jaws movie and this delivers it there should have been 10 more moments like this in this movie but sadly there aren't yeah then you would have had a jaws movie but as opposed to this 3d nightmare of nothing they spill into the water and nobody gets eaten bo right but they all get rescued uh by the boats and you're like what what the hell jaws 3d (laughs) what am i here for you know you just tease me with this fin coming out of the water but we'll get to it Uh, we see the shark is is like look i'm not here to naughty people so if you skiers aren't gonna be cooperative i'm just gonna have to go after the bumper boats which is what jaws 3d does heads over to the bumper boats and but wouldn't you know it jaws 3d happens to crash into the one bumper boat with sean the younger brother and leah thompson they pop out of the bumper boat straight into the water and jaws 3d just takes a chunk out of leah thompson's leg carries her around takes her for a little bit of a ride chad this scene in particular there's a real layup of a good shot to do here where once sean is spilled into the water right you do the shot from the first one where the shark's leaving the lagoon and swims by him you know the shot i'm talking about absolutely why they don't do that in this movie is head scratching like you're doing all kinds of dumb tips of the hat to the original film why not just take one of the best shots of the movie and steal it because then it would be the one good shot in your movie because they weren't thinking about any of that in fairness yes and so jaws 3d finally lets leah thompson go and they drag her to the shore but then jaws 3d is like well 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 looks like some beefcakes are on a raft maybe i could smash this into tiny little pieces which is exactly what happens and so a bunch of people get spilled into the water there did jaws 3d one of those no none of them get eaten and then dennis quaid who's on the other side of the lagoon he hops in a ski boat and zips across the lagoon to check on his brother where he finds leah thompson suffering from a shark bite to the leg or what uh, some experts call a bleeding thigh prosthetic <laughs> hd does this movie no favors there are some movies that really do not benefit from 1080p or better right jaws 3d is like number six on the all-time list of movies that are better the lower the resolution explain to me what happens next Catherine goes in and either opens or closes the main drain i have no Uh idea she's dreamed of doing that her whole life and nothing happened and then cindy and sandy show up and they're either inside or outside (laughs) we're in the lagoon asshole (laughs) the dolphins are in the lagoon now i guess well that's gonna matter later and then lewis gossett jr he gets on this public announcement system and addresses all of the people that are in the (laughs) underwater kingdom viewing area and he says hello all y'all nice people down there may i have your kind of teach on it turns out we got ourselves a giant shark up here in the lagoon that's eating people. There's no reason for you all to scream or roar as you make your way to the exit as quickly as possible, but you all need to get out of there or you're probably going to get eaten. And as soon as the microphone is turned off, Lewis Gossett Jr. just flips a switch and he's like, give me some light down there. Can't you see there's some shit going on? Get an ambulance. Somebody going to get killed down there. All right, did you see the size of that shark? It'll bite the head off a goddamn elephant. It really is maybe the best Lewis Gossett Jr. moment in the movie is when he flips this switch. Also worth pointing out, not to take a step back here, but once Leah Thompson is loaded into the ambulance, Sean goes with her, and that is it for those characters in this movie. We never see or hear from them again. We assume everything went fine. So after Lewis Gossett Jr. gives his nephew a real dressing down about this, Jaws 3D does a hilariously bad flyby of the tunnel 
Oh, wow, that looks like a cheap model. And then, to paraphrase the movie Parenthood, Jaws 3D likes to butt things with its head. Yes. And starts to bash the tunnel, at which point water starts to flood in, lights are flickering. Hey, everyone, I'm going to eat some of you. Who wants to get eaten? Scream really loud and piss your pants. You there in the back, come down for it. I'm going to eat you first, all right? Ooh, look at that one. He's a big one. I know what you're thinking. It's a shame that there's only 15 to 20 minutes left in the movie, and I've not really been in hardly at all, but that's what my contract was negotiated by my manager, all right? I got paid the same whether I was here or not. They finally get all these people into pods. They get them out of the tunnels, uh-huh. at which point these automatic doors seal shut to prevent them from drowning. But they flood up to their waist, where everybody can piss and not be embarrassed. But the water turns purple, Chad. They don't tell you that, but... That's what happens uh, in the ocean. Then one of the minimum wage SeaWorld attendants steps up to calm everybody down by reminding everyone how precious little oxygen they have. Everybody calm down. You're all going to choke to death if you don't. She's like Kevin Bacon in Animal House during that parade. Please remain calm. We cut to Dennis Quaid, who is now in the Terminator 2 foundry for some reason. Yes. Where (laughs) brawny men are just welding steel. Am I talking? Tough enough! Yeah. Da, 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 da. <laughs> and he's naturally chain smoking and looking at a map of something. Kathy shows up and is like, hey, have you been working down here? Yes, of course I've been working. I'm not trying to go out and score cocaine if that's what you're implying. No, I've been here the whole time. I didn't leave Charlie in charge. Charlie, did I leave you in charge the whole time? No, I didn't go out and get cocaine, did I, Charlie? <laughs> Charlie never lies. By the way, look at this. Look at this. Does this look like a cocaine treasure map to you? I think it's a cocaine treasure map. She tells him, like, look, you're doing all you can in the sense that you are debilitated mentally and physically right now by your lack of sleep so i just want you to know that i'm here for moral support i love you i hope you don't kill all those people in the tunnel and you let me know what you need i'll be at home making sure that there's enough downers bennies and michelobes to even you back out outside the undersea kingdom the media has shown up and this pr spokesman is there and he's asked all kinds of questions like was there an explosion has anybody died what would you do for a klondike bar and the spokesman says earlier there was a minor disturbance and one of the tunnels had something happen and we estimate that between two and one thousand people are trapped in the tunnels there was a fish related incident that may or may not have resulted in the trapping and potential drowning of let's say people with guest status stop avoiding the question what would you do for a klondike bar this press conference is over we cut to those 20 people trapped in the tunnels with water up to their waist and then the movie bounces over to lewis gossett jr who is beside the lagoon he's looking pretty distraught and fitz royce shows up and he says my french man seven and i we're gonna lure this shark into the pipe and we're gonna dispose of it once and for all you can finish off your welding and save your trapped tourist we're gonna guarantee that that shark is gonna follow us into this tube because we're gonna use live bait meaning presumably him with that settled, Louis Casa Jr. and Kathy are like, well, we're going to go up to headquarters and make sure that all of this goes according to plan. And they get to their undersea headquarters. Why is it underwater, Bo? I don't know, Chad. And also, if the tunnels are busted, how did they get there? There's a lot of questions that right. deserve some answers, but I really love the fact that when they get to the headquarters, Louis Gossett Jr. Jr. is kind of monitoring all the, the video screens. Hey, Uncle, I got everything under control right here. Huh. Oh, my God. There's the shark. Yeah. And he's like, oh, wait, that's just one of the dolphins. And they're like, hee, we got you. We're like the impractical jokers. Hee. They take off and Louis Gossett Jr. is like, I tell you what, nephew, you are a real disappointment. No, when I get home, I'm going to punch your mama right in the mouth. <laughs> See, episode one, season one. <laughs> anyway, back at the lagoon, uh, the the French male companion, Tate, is really trying to, you know, Alfred Pennyworth uh, Fitzroy here. Right. Where he's like, listen, sir, I would just feel so much better if you weren't trying to carry one of the cameras at the same time. Why don't you let me, your faithful manservant, do that for you? And he's like, oh, don't you think I can do it? I can do anything 
Why, I've never been eaten by any of the animals that I photographed, and I don't expect that trend to end tonight. Whoops, I just dropped and broke a mirror. Hold on, let me bend over. <laughs> I can't believe I just walked under that ladder. Get that black cat out of here. <laughs> so, Dennis Quaid and his light pontoon are now in position over the tunnel, and he's going to go down and fix the breach in these tunnel walls right. as Tate and Fitzroyce are diving in. So they kind of coordinate this jump where Fitzroyce is diving into this pipe and they're going to trap it in these filtration lines. Louis Gossett Jr., who's coordinating all this, is like, okay, Alpha Team, you go to the filtration pipes. We'll see you in a minute. Now, Delta Team, you're going to swim on down there and fix that tunnel. Everybody on three. One, two, three. Kill Shock. Fitzroyce and his buddy tie a rope to the far end of this filtration tunnel and then start waving around some vials of blood to draw Jaws 3D into this filtration tunnel. And they're clanging the walls to get its attention. They're like truly ringing the dinner bell. Right. And then Fitzroyce swims up the shaft <laughs> and Jaws 3D <laughs> is like, oh boy, that's where I was hanging out earlier. I'm going to eat me a diver tonight. Jaws 3D goes in into the tunnel and keeps chasing and chasing fitzroyce is pulling himself along by this rope but wouldn't you know it the rope breaks i didn't understand any of this i didn't know what the hell was going on it wasn't until the second time i watched it recently that i was like oh okay i understand what their plan is now it's just not made very clear okay so when the rope breaks suddenly he is now unable to propel himself fast enough uh -huh. to get away from jaws 3d he has to turn and kind of fight and he uses the camera to bang on its snout but jaws 3d is it's like, ow, that is not going to deter me from eating you, mister. So then he gets a knife and it's stab, stab, stab. But then Jaws eats him and we get some inside the gullet shots of Fitzroyce like struggling and trying to kill this shark by removing a grenade. And one presumes he's about to pull the pin when Jaws 3D gives him a fatal chomp. Yeah. And it's kind of nice. You're inside the belly of the shark. It's like John Voight getting chomped on by the anaconda from the inside out. Yeah. And and just like that, I wish there had been more schlocky stuff like this. We cut over to Dennis Quaid, who's doing some of his handy dandy welding work. And then Catherine, out of nowhere, she just decides, hey, I need to go down there and help Dennis Quaid. Why you gonna do that? Just because the movie needs me to go down there. So she jumps in the water and then Dennis Quaid is in the water. Fritz Royce is dead. His French manservant makes his way out of the water. I don't really know how that happens, but when he pops out of the water, Fritz Royce has not returned. And this manservant is beside himself. He's like, mon ami, c'est ce Fritz Royce, Fritz Royce, mi amor, no! He spews forth a string of European gibberish that was completely <laughs> indecipherable. And I didn't watch this with the uh, subtitles <laughs> on and i didn't turn them on for this because the fact that this was just a bunch of syllables thrown together with no real meaning i think conveyed the sense of loss and desperation far more than any intelligible line could it was like listening to the eulogy at the death of a minion it was the <laughs> scream that tony collette gives when she finds the headless body of her child in the backseat of hereditary. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, it is a wail of pure anguish. Louis Gossett Jr. decides, we need to turn off all the pumps in the tunnel to suffocate the shark. Louis Gossett Jr. Jr., turn off those pumps so that we can kill Jaws 3D so she can all escape the tunnel, huh? Kathy has suited up in the headquarters and has descended into the water so she could be, as she puts it, the eyes in the back of Dennis Quaid's head, a.k.a the only pair of non-bloodshot eyes in the water sure and so while this filtration pump is being turned back on jaws 3d starts whipping its tail back and forth look at me look what i can do bang 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 lewis gossett jr and lewis gossett jr jr are watching on the video screen as the tail just whips the gate until it opens back up and then jaws 3d backs out Back into the lagoon. Now we have our true finale set up. If you say so. Louis Gossett Jr. calls down to the pontoon boat. And he's like, hey, you better get that Dennis Quaid up out of there. Now, uh, you may need to jerk that rope three or four hundred times. Because Dennis Quaid, you know, he's going to think that's just the, the natural jitters of his heart pumping about 437 times a minute on account of all that cocaine. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. So sure enough, these guys are jerking on his, the safety rope, and he does not seem to ever notice that this has happened. And uh, so he doesn't come up, but then Jaws 3D shows up. Surprise, it's me, Jaws 3D, your worst nightmare. This shark roars at them as it shows up, (laughs) which is very funny. And then the dolphins appear and they're like, let's get this guy what for? (laughs) And they just start screwing with Jaws 3D where they're like nipping at her fins and at her face. It's like those two orcas that bullied Tillicum in our last episode's introduction. Yeah, these dolphins are real jerks. Finally, though, Jaws 3D is going after them. This is bullshit. What are, you guys are assholes. Yeah, we know. So are you. <laughs> All right, we'll see you at the end of the movie. Meanwhile, Dennis Quaid and Kathy swim back to headquarters through this tunnel that allows them to ascend. It's some safety hatch that lets them get up They're in a submarine or something. Before they could close the door, Jaws Jaws grabs it? (laughs) I don't think so. You're not going up there without Jaws 3D. It won't close until it does. It doesn't mean anything and it's not all that tense. They climb up into the headquarters and Disquade is like, look, I know that I went down there to fix the tunnel and that's just what I did. I think I should be rewarded (laughs) in cocaine. And since the welding job is done, all the water pressure subsides and all of the people who have collectively pissed their pants in the tunnels, they are able to get out of the undersea kingdom and make their way to freedom and essentially find themselves as participants in a class action lawsuit. Oh yeah, SeaWorld is closing its doors after this. (laughs) Don't even worry about it. They get out and that's kind of the last we hear about any of this tunnel stuff in the movie. Back at the undersea headquarters, the model shark of Jaws 3D, it floats absolutely motionlessly towards them in 3D until the glass shatters, a la, again, Friday the 13th 3D, and that floods the headquarters. Yes. The lady tech, who we haven't talked about and doesn't have any lines, she is drowned or passes out or is knocked out by uh, swallowing too much water. Lewis Gossett junior junior gets eaten right yeah it's by far the best kill of the movie there's a good shot of him getting chomped right as jaws 3d is backing up lewis gossett jr is like well now i better take this lady that got knocked unconscious out of here i better take her up to the to get some hell he swims out of the movie he's gone too he doesn't get killed no We'll talk about him in a moment, though. Briefly. And so now it's Dennis Quaid and Kathy who are trapped by the shark. Jaws 3D keeps trying to get into the headquarters. Who's next? I'm still hungry. Louis Gossett Jr. Jr. was more of an aperitif. While it's kind of chomping, Dennis Quaid spies with his little bloodshot eye Uh the hand of Fitzroy's holding a grenade. A yellow grenade that we saw earlier. That's right. You know how you make it explode, Bo? You You got to pull pull the pin pin out. So he fashions this crude (laughs) Sandman style hook. Hand me that clothes hanger. Bend, bend, twist, bend. I'm totally going to get my car keys. Don't even call a locksmith. I can do it. I'm going to do about $300 in damage to my car as I'm trying to open the lock that would have cost me $60 if I'd called that guy. Ka-thunk. Damn it. Ka-thunk. Damn it. There's this whole thing where Kathy swims over Jaws 3D and then I guess to distract it maybe or something. Hey, where are you going? Hold on a second. You're going to take my picture off? Smile, you son of a... That's what we say when we're smiling for pictures because of your, uh, that one's dad. That His dad <laughs> tried to kill his shark with a rifle and he said, smile, you son of a bitch. So now it kind of got out in the shark community some. So now when we go to pictures, we say smile you son of a it, it's a little in joke for all us sharks anyway i'm gonna go ahead and eat the lady one so some quick cocaine thinking and dennis quaid <laughs> takes this piece of metal with a hook on it and he grabs the pin of the grenade yanks it out and jaws 3d explode and the screen is filled with a mass of cloudy blood and we see the upper and lower set of shark teeth rush out toward the screen in 3d rush out to a point and then just stop right as if newtonian physics is all a great big lie it's so bad and then our heroes question mark dennis uh-huh. quaid and kathy pop up in the water as the sun rises yes they're overjoyed to be alive bo there's a lot of adr to wrap this movie up here it's nice what happened to lewis gossett jr and that other nameless employee they're fine don't worry about it that ought to be the only line don't even yeah. worry about it it's fine don't worry lewis gossett jr is going to spend the rest of his life in deposition 
sessions, courtrooms, or behind bars. And Iron Eagle <laughs> movies. Louis Gossett Jr., for your crimes against SeaWorld, I sentence you to Iron Eagle 3. Kathy then says, Hey, Dennis Quaid, what happened to those fat asses, Cindy and Sandy the Dolphins? You, <laughs> you know, you're being a real bitch right now. I mean, we kind of saved your lives. <laughs> and then at that exact moment, these two dolphins pop up from the water just in time for a freeze frame as the movie comes to an end in classic 1980s freeze frame style right dennis quaid and kathy are high-fiving don't you forget about me you saw us as you wanted to see us in I'll simplest terms a shark dancing, you know a jaws 3d baby. a cocaine addicted maintenance apart. man a biologist and Aaliyah Thompson. Together at all, baby. Sincerely, the SeaWorld Club. <laughs> and that's Jaws 3D. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just awful chad this is like i know we say this a lot like this is one of the worst movies we've ever talked about on the show <laughs> i know i know but this is truly truly a bad movie i mean it doesn't hang together at all nobody cares about this nobody it's not one of those bad movies where it's like you know this this like john void is really trying in this movie he's it, you may disagree with the performance uh-huh. but he's given a performance nobody cares in this movie nobody gives a shit the special effects effects are terrible the script is awful (laughs) the characters are unlikable it is a movie that dares you to focus on it for more than a few minutes at a time with this being the season finale of season 16 as we have made a tradition of doing we rank our movies from best to worst worst to best however we want to figure this out so how would you rank these movies from worst to best telling someone don't watch this to do watch this Okay, I would probably put Jaws 3D at the bottom. Okay. Because I just don't think there's any reason to watch it at all. We had a good time with it, but it's a, it, it's not fun to watch ever. At number five, I'm going to put The Swarm. Okay. Because it's so long and it's so boring. The number four is going to be Anaconda because we're starting to inch into, hey, these are watchable territory. And so number three <laughs> is Orca because Orca is a delight. And also there is that killer whale abortion that is you can't unsee. Like once you've seen that in that movie, you'll never unsee it. <laughs> right. Top two slots. Number two is going to be Alligator. And that's a great movie. Alligator is a great movie, but it's no Grizzly. And that is my number one. Knowing you, all of that makes sense. We share the same bottom. Jaws 3D is just absolute trash. I put The Swarm next because it's so long. It doesn't need to be that long. I put Orca as number four. Sure. Then I went Grizzly. And then my top two, I put Anaconda as number two because John Voight is so entertaining to watch. And I'm putting Alligator as my number one. That was to me one of the most surprisingly just as far as like Jaws ripoffs, it hit all the right beats. It was goofy. It was earnest. The cop was a creep. The alligator ate all kinds of people. We had that one kid telling the cop to go fuck himself. <laughs> it was, was just great. it was just delightful. And when that alligator goes nuts at that dinner party yeah. on the lawn or the, the wedding or whatever the hell it is, yep. I mean, that is a tremendous sequence. Seeing that guy get crushed in that limo with a giant alligator that was all done with practical effects and everything. It looks great. <laughs> it's like something out of Street Fighter 2. This has been a terrific season. Are we doing another season of this podcast? Yeah. Next season, as has been wildly requested by the listeners, Uh-oh. we're heading back into comic book territory but we're not limiting ourselves this time uh back back, uh, a few seasons ago we did a season called the old men in dc i remember that one about the dc movies but we're not doing that again we're leaving all that behind us we have spread our wings and we're embracing all comic books so there is nothing off the table as long as it is a comic adaptation you stand a chance of appearing in season 17 of pick six movies and chad you're going to uh to lead us off so why don't you tell us what will premiere season 17 a season we are calling Comic Sans 